just die young. Hello and welcome to another of the industry interviews with me, your host, Lance Nielsen, co-founder of The Outcast Creative, an eclectic mix of actors, writers and directors located from all over the world uh, with acting classes in London and Birmingham. And we're also doing theatre productions, usually one a year, and we've got one coming up um, in October in Birmingham and London about the post office scandal the biggest miscarriage of justice in British history called False Accounts. So do get along to see that. All the information is on our Facebook page at The Outcast Creative. You can find me and all the links are all down there, as are the links for my wonderful guest, actor Stephen Marcus, who's going to be coming on shortly. But first of all, I think we should show his showreel because this is a man who has a career spanning many decades with many roles, uh, I think that truly shows what a fantastically versatile actor he is. Now, I have only been using share screen on StreamYard for a short period of time, so let's see if I can do it without messing it up. Here we go. Okay, so here is Stephen's um, IMDb. Uh, let's just see if we can get that a little bit bigger, and we'll have a look uh, at his uh, showreel before we, we bring the man in himself. Uh, if you have any questions, for Stephen, you pop them in the chat, and I will get around to them, I promise you. But we've got a lot to talk about with the man this evening. So let's have a look at some of his work here. If I can get it to play. There we go. Fantastic. It's been a bit laggy. Why has it been so laggy? Well... We appear to be having a bit of lag for the very first time on an interview ever. I'm having a bit of issues getting this to play. I might have to bring him in and play it later. But let's 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 let me just try refreshing it, see if we can get it to play. Try again. Try again. Oh my god. There we go. Oh for fuck's sake, it's still lagging. Yeah, okay. We're gonna have some issues with this. I think. Gonna have some issues with this. That's annoying. I don't know why. Okay, all right. Well, that's going to be a bit laggy, so we might have to watch it in a little bit. Okay, well, in that case, without any further ado, I'm going to bring my guest in. Hi, Stephen. So as you can see, I'm having some technical issues um, with playing your showreel. But welcome to the interview. Thank you so much for giving up your time on a Sunday. I know it's very valuable kind of kids and family time, so... I don't underestimate what that means, so I really appreciate you coming along. I'd love to show a bit of your acting career, but for some reason we've got really bad lag on the internet for the minute. I don't know why that is. I'm just trying to bring it up on my screen so I can send you a link to my Vimeo version of it. Yeah, um, that would be good. I'm having the same lag. Uh, it's now just opened up, so... Um, well, shall we leave it for a little bit to just kind of let things... I mean, it is loading on IMDb, but it's being very slow. If, uh, yeah, hang on, let me find, uh, I'm finding your old email and I can just send it straight to you now. Or even my, e even my new email would be. The email, uh, sorry, when I say old email, I mean the, the email. <laughs> even my recent email. Um, Where are we? Where are you? What do you look like? You look like. You I'm look a, like... Lance Nielsen, filmmaker, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you're uh, on my, I have two pages. One is, uh. Prime, uh, it's very important names and my name, and you're on the very important list. Oh, so, I, was about to, I was about to say thank you very much. That's, uh, that's what I was saying. Very important. I like that. Here we um, go. Here we go. I'm on like that. Um, fantastic. Right, well, I'm sending you the link to it now. Yeah, so, whack it. Whack it over to me, and uh, we'll see if we can... Um, We'll see if we can get that working because it would certainly be because I mean 
one of the things that's really impressive about you is you've had a really long and quite varied career. I have, yes. In all three sure. food in all three food groups on the menu, film, theatre, and television. And, and although I, I think we and knew a little bit of radio as well. Oh uh, yeah, that's right. And a little bit of radio. And um although we knew of each other for a while, we didn't actually get to meet in the flesh until you did the the bodyguard, which yes. I want to, which I want to say, uh, was, uh, was was that sort of 2016, something like that. Oh God, hang on, I've been here since 20, 2015. 2015. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, all right. Well, let's uh, uh, let me just check my email. This is a very hodgepodge way to start an interview, but you know it's YouTube, so I'll get away with it. Um, yeah, no, oh my no. God, God, I should have checked my emails when I got in. I got about 30 emails here. Right, yeah, okay, the latest one is from you. Here we go. This is why, actually, I usually try and get MP4 uh, files um, right. from from people because that, that that way I can make sure I don't yeah. have any lag. Right, so I've got it, and I, and it's but it's got the same thing. It, I can see the grey bar is being really slow. Uh, must be um, your it's internet. Just got, it, it, no, it's not my internet. I think it's just the internet because my the- I've got – yeah, as in it's probably a bit slow today. Right. Um, it might be to well, do with the heat and all that kind of thing. Who knows? Well, Sunday, I suppose, a lot of people on it. It's Sunday evening where you are. People could are be. Could be. So, um, you know, or it might just be um, that geezer whose parts you keep nicking in America. Maybe he's getting annoyed and he's trying to somehow fuck up this interview a little bit. Um, the guy who played the original bodyguard in um, uh, the Whitney Houston film, I forget the actor's name now. Yeah, he was in... I forget the actor's name. I think he's passed on now, I believe. Has he? Oh, I did he? Yeah. I think, no, do you, what? do you know what? I think he did. I think you're right. I think he passed on. Now you've got me wanting to look that up. He, no. he, was in, um, he was in that film with Vanity, um, with the barge rhythm of The Last Dragon. He was in The Last Dragon, which has right. got a massive cult following. And I was thinking, as I was coming back back from town today, I was mm. thinking, yeah, you're kind of like the British version of him in a way, and I, I'm, and I mean that in the nicest possible um, way. Uh, Mike Starr. Mike, yes, Mike, I know, yes. Mike Starr, that was his name. I think if you look, he is uh, still alive. You, you've been trying to kill him off, but he actually is still around. I'm not that. <laughs> um, uh, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, all right. Let me stop, stop with that one. Um, don't about any actors or famous people of any kind because they're all dead to me. They're all <laughs> I'll just start rumours about people being dead. Um, yeah, we don't we don't want to do that. Uh, that, that, no, would be bad. Want no. that would be bad. That would be bad. Um, that would be terrible. But you you I mean we'll come back to the bodyguard in a bit. But you, that's the role you played on the stage production, the role that Mike Starr did in the in the movie. Yeah, yeah. You, you played his character on the on the stage I'm sorry. When, I, when when i saw you were in the program when we were going to see it i thought i know exactly what role steven's going to play he's going to play the mike star part and you're sure right. enough and i thought yeah if i was casting it I I was you like, who's the british who's the british actor that, that could yeah. play that role I, you'd be top of the list i've forgotten that you came to see that and uh you came yeah, we, to yeah we went for a drink um afterwards and actually we went in that bar. Do you remember where there's? They had the karaoke downstairs. No. In the, ba- in the base. Yeah, there was a karaoke going on in the basement downstairs. And my uh, fun. This is a weird bit of synchronicity. Yes. Yeah. Um, and my friend Carly was there with her friend Orlando, who I introduced you to. So you may oh. recognise her because she's in hospital at the minute. Bless her. Oh, um, quite ser- quite seriously ill, and I've just been to see her. So we're going to give her a shout out. And that's her. She was in Harry Potter um, oh, yeah. Yeah, in a cu- couple of the movies. And she was there and she was proper pleased to, to meet you. Um, so, Carly, big shout out from me and Stephen. We really hope you get better soon. We want to be want to see you doing more acting. So, uh, you know, we want to see you out of that hospital um, and getting better. We were talking about all kinds of script ideas when we were in the pub. It was, it was, it was like, it was a production meeting. It was nuts. <laughs> so we were like, Oh, we've got this great idea for a script Lance. So I was like, shit, I haven't even brought my notepad or anything. I thought we were just going to eat pizza. So, yeah. all right, let's get into your career then. Um, so, right. I mean, uh, it's a bit of a formulaic question, but what was, what was, I mean, you're not, you're not your typical actor. You haven't come through the class kind of rather Benedict cabbage patch kind of element. No, you're, you're, but I did go to 
drama school, and they did try to turn me into Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah, I can see oh. that that was partially successful. No, I, um, I, I mean, I, I got into it when I was at sixth form college. Uh, right. I left school, didn't have a single qualification of any sort. I was a very naughty boy in school, didn't study. And <laughs> um, I uh, went to sixth form college uh to get something some things some o levels behind me and one of them involved doing some drama uh and the teacher there said uh teacher libby bell said you're quite good at this have you thought about doing it for a career and i said no but i'll give it a go so i went from there i went to a nearby technical college in, in portsmouth on the south coast uh hybrid tech shout out to hybrid head technicians and uh, um did a two-year drama course there before going up to london to arts educational to do my three-year vocational drama studies. Uh, and the thing that actually, the, the movie that actually made me really want to continue doing it was Midnight Express. Oh, no way. That's yeah, I saw Midnight Express when I was at the technical college and uh, I thought it was amazing, that particularly the horrible guard, the horrible prison guard. Uh, and I thought, I want to do roles like that. I want to do that. And um, and that is kind of what kept me going, but what, what made me think, right, yeah, I don't want to mess about this. This is what I really want to do. Mm. Yeah. And so I did it and studied three years in drama school. I actually got, got a chance to try and redo that part in drama school in a play called uh, by Jean Genet called Death Watch. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Playing a prison guard, a horrible, nasty prison guard, uh, which I, so I, I was able to emulate my, I can't think of a word. Uh, that role that inspired me. So okay. Yeah, that inspiration. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I left drama school in 1984. Um, was lucky enough to go straight into some work, did a theatre play for six months in the theatre, uh, children's theatre uh, during the summer. And then I got my beautiful laundrette, beginning of 1985, which I did with Daniel Day Lewis. Um, and Say Jaffrey, Ross and Seth, Shelly Ann Field, who I worked with a few times after that. Um, yeah, that, that was a big, I mean, that was a big critical success, that it film. Was. And it and it launched a lot of careers. And it was it was, I mean, I remember the poster, the two guys either side of the washing machine, Day Lewis with mm. his like blonde, very gay looking hair. Um <laughs> well, that was it was about it was it was about uh, a gay relationship, effectively. It was, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. That, that, as well as being a, 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 a style of film that projected uh, put, projected lots of actors into new, into big names, into careers, it yeah. also brought to attention um, interracial gay love. Yeah, well. I mean, it, it was quite groundbreaking in its day because you're That's talking yeah. early to mid-'80s, still massive homophobia, still a lot of legal homophobia within the government, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and not a lot of LGBT content around at that time. There's a few films and TV shows about AIDS, but but not um, an yeah. HIV, but not really just about gay characters being themselves. And I think there was Maurice, there was Maurice that came around, around out around that time. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which was sort of, that was the, the posh gay guy. And then this was more... Your regular guys, wasn't it? Your, your, yeah, sort of... and that, that was the other thing as well. It, it also put, was bringing up uh, points about racism as well because Daniel Day Lewis was part of our gang of racist thugs before right. falling in love with uh Gordon, Wayne. yeah. Uh, and um, and that was uh, you know, that, that, that was quite controversial for the time as well, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a film that still holds up pretty well i think it does um, yeah i mean all films date i think and i think it's dated in its style and it's it's camera sure. work and it's it's lighting look etc like that you, i don't think you can avoid dating in any movie like that but the story uh and what it's saying is still relevant i think uh some people might say they prefer dated camera work to the jj abraham style but i guess that's all down to choice yeah um, jj abraham's is dated as well isn't he well this is true yeah. uh i mean i just before we pause and, and jump onto other stuff in your early career, so just mm. to understand the chronology, so you went to the drama school. Now, did you come straight out of that with an agent, or did you? Uh, luckily, yes, I did. Right. I um, we they, they they do these things. They, 
you know, when you're in drama school, in your last year of drama school, you get showcases. Uh, you do shows and, and you invite people, you have a committee that invites uh, agents yeah. along. And sometimes they come, sometimes they don't. Unfortunately, I we did right. um, we did a, what was the show? It was a, a, a Canterbury Tales. A kind of comedic pantomime version of the Canterbury Tales. Uh, and I ended up doing um, a Scottish character in, in, in one of the scenes in it. And a guy called Jimmy Fraser from Peter's Fraser and Dunlop, which was a big agency in that time. BFD, yeah, I, I know the story about why they broke up, and that my God, that's a movie waiting to happen. But let's—I let's well, actually don't know that story. But but they we'll yeah, they, broke, they they split off and became a, a United Talent Agency. That's right. Here in yeah. London, and uh, it, was the, it was the Americans that caused all that. But yeah, and, yeah. Um, but Jimmy Fraser was Scottish. Saw me do this character, and called me into the office, thinking I was Scottish. So, uh, and I walk into the office and go, "Hello, Jimmy. How'd you do? All right?" And I went, "You're not Scottish." I'm like, no. Oh, you must be fucking good then. All right, let's sign you up. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And are you, are you still with him now? Or uh, no, I've, I've, I've been through a few, a uh, couple of agents since then. Right. Um, I, I stayed with them after the right, uh, right. For ages, the Jimmy Jimmy Fraser actually retired about two years after I joined them, right? Uh, and then I went through a few agents in there and ended up with Dallas Smith, who's now at UTA. Um, yeah, agents. And um, then I left there probably after about fourteen years. Right. Uh, the London management, which then became Curtis Brown. I was with London management at one Brilliant. point. Yeah, um, I was with them in their last year before they they broke up, and that was um, Mark Berlin. I uh, don't know, Mark. I was with Sarah Spear. He was one of the, well, he was one of the d directors. And then he, okay. they broke up and dissolved and it became Mark Berlin Associates. Um, but right. they, didn't, they didn't take me with him. Oh. So, you know. Oh, <laughs> well, Sarah, yeah. Sarah Spear and um, a few others went off and started up the, the drama, the theatrical arm of, of Curtis Brown, who were, at that time were just a literary agent. Right, yeah, yeah. It's, just, oh. it's only bloody Nick the Bubble and Squeak. Yeah, that's Nerdly UK who runs his own little podcast, who was a co-host of mine oh, uh, right. the other day. Lovely guy and a big fan of yours, so I thought I'd just put, put that okay. out there. Um, um, so where was I? <laughs> yeah, we were talking about agents. Agents, you left. Yeah, you yeah, left. Yeah, just been, yeah. agents, been from there, and then I, then I went to – I'm very, very loyal to my agents. Yeah, I, They could be rubbish, and I'd still stay with them. Uh, I don't know if that's because I'm loyal or I'm lazy. I'm not sure which. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't, after after uh, after um, being with uh, Curtis Brown for a while, I went, they went to um, uh, I've forgotten what they were called. They're now known as Intertalent, but I right. don't know work or before that, I've forgotten now. But yeah, yeah, went to them, and then I left there. I left there when I moved to LA in five years ago. Because the, the big story over here, if you don't know it, you've probably heard it, is that Troika, who were a proper fierce agent, and they, they were... Yeah, a, they were a what, they, they were cooperative, weren't they? Well, they also... I don't know that they were a co-op, but they, they also... Like, the guys that went and set United up, some of them went and did Troika, and the others did United. Okay. And, and Troika were, a, were known for their really quite fierce, hard negotiating tactics, which for the actors was great for producers was terrifying <laughs> and and um yeah they've just they've just broken up they've just you know big thing okay. probably probably worthy of a mini series whatever the story is right. and um but i've often wanted to write the play about what happened with pfd because i know the whole inside story i was following it as it developed because i had a friend who was there who was like ringing me saying lance what should i do what should i do this is what's I happening i was like i don't fucking know <laughs> But it, it was the Americans came over and wanted to completely reorganize things because they bought a massive share out in the company. Right. And uh, I, I believe um, they they said something along, and this is a long time ago now, so I, I, forgive me if I'm wrong, um, but it was something like anybody on the books who's earned less than 50 grand last year, we're firing them. And um, the agents were like, fuck off, no, you're not. So two of the agents met over that weekend, phoned every single client on their books and between the two of them they owned the meat of the acting agency at pfd they had all the big clients like kate winslet and tom hardy and so on and so on and um they called every single actor 
there was all these conference calls and everything. And then when PFD came back on Monday, they had practically no actors left. And these two people had left and started up their own agency. I think that may have been Dallas. Was that? It may have been. Yeah. 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 United was one of the ones that came out of that. Yeah. So right. it may well have been. I, yeah. I, I mean, I've got it. He reps Kate Winslet. So yeah, everyone, that sounds right. Always been and he, he came to see one of my plays and I believe took on one of the girls that was in it. So right. there you go. he yeah. loves a he loves a lady. I mean, I don't mean that in a uh, uh, in a, uh, uh, a me too mock that way. I mean, no, a, no, no. He loves women actresses. He, he just loves looking after actresses rather than yeah. actors. Um, I don't know why that is. But, uh, um, and I'm sure it doesn't mean anything. It's just, no, 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 but he works better for them. That's all. Well, if that's been his forte, then you know, why not? I suppose. And he's a great um, I like him. He's a nice bloke. I've, I've had dealings with him since, uh, just asking favors and things that, 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 and he's helped me out, you know, even though we split up, you know, it's like agents having an, having an agent, it's a bit like being married. And yeah. Up, you know, when, it, when it's over, it's quite painful to break up sometimes, whoever, whichever one instigates it. Yeah. But you still care for each other. And, and if, when, when needed, we'll help each other out. Well, if you've been with someone for 14 years, that's, that's longer than quite a lot of marriages, I think. So, <laughs> yes, uh, it is, yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, look, go, going to your early work then, mm -hmm. you, we, you, we've talked about beautiful laundrette. I mean... If you ever watch any of my podcasts um, or these videos, if I can ever bring it up, I will always mention our friends in the north. Oh, um, yeah. Because for me, the, the 90s for ITV and BBC, that was the pinnacle of their own homemade drama before it all got farmed out to different companies and things. Yeah, and, um, it was a great, two, great show. The two shows for me that define that era were Our Friends in the North and which was – you know, North South Divide, brilliant story about four people, launched the careers of Mark Strong, Daniel Craig, Gina McKee, and Chris Eccleston. And then you had the London version of similar kind of thing in a way, but was like shortcuts, which was holding on, which was David Morrissey, Leslie Manville, Phil Davis, um, not Phil Davis, Phil Daniels, um, about all these different people's lives in London who cross connect. Just was fucking brilliant. Did you did you have any inkling of sort of what um, our friends in the north was how epic it felt. I mean, was there a sense yeah. of that? I mean, yeah, I think with everything, you never know what it's gonna end up like and how it's gonna get received. But mm. definitely, with that one, that one, I do recall thinking, This is big, this is a main, this is a, is a big story. I didn't really know, you, you as you probably know, uh, as an actor, you don't get old as the whole script sometimes, you just get your part, your part, yeah. So, the scenes you're in or the, the episodes you're in rather. Uh, and so you don't see the whole storyline so you don't so I, I wasn't fully aware of that whole northern thing going on I, I, yeah because you were aware of the, the storyline with Daniel Craig Malcolm McDowell yeah which uh, for those people who haven't seen it was set in the 1960s Soho Dirty Squad era where yeah. the police the police were controlling how many porno shops there were in Soho and we're all corrupt and we're kind of taking their cut. Mm. And your character was sort of like the head of security for um, yeah. Malcolm McDowell's firm. And you tried to double cross him, if I remember rightly. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then, and then good kicking for it. Yeah. My friend Paul McNeely, I believe, gave you that good kicking. It was the tall bald geezer in that. Scene. Oh, no, no. Yeah. Yes. He didn't actually do the kicking himself. Right. Uh, he just produced the tool, which was a hammer. Because in the scene, what happens is I, I pretend yeah. to be on on Malcolm's side, and then I step forward and turn and go, "No, ha ha! Actually, yeah. I'm on the I'm on the bad guy's side, uh, or the other side." And he goes, "Well, if you're going to do it, you should pay him properly." And 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 then your friend Paul steps forward, hands over a hammer, which he then <laughs> all over yeah. the, all the brain splurt there. He bought out the people that betrayed you, and did you? Did you know that it was based on a play? Because it was written by Peter Flannery and it was originally a play at Stratford-upon-Avon. No, I did not, no. Yeah, um, which had it had all the same characters but some slightly different storylines, a lot of stuff to do with um, 
the importing of goods to Rhodesia and back and forth and apartheid. And that, that, that was mentioned in one dinner scene in the show is actually a big storyline in the, in the play. But um, I dedicated one of my plays to Peter Flannery because I did a big play about the conflict in Northern Ireland and it was basically our friends in Northern Ireland. That's what it was. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, so, and I, and that play's just gone to print. So I finally got to thank Peter Flannery in the forward for, inspiring oh, nice. me to write it did he did you get to meet him was he on set at all when you were uh, no no and were well, you uh, were you directed by Stuart urban at first yes. and then he was replaced wasn't he part way through filming again i don't it's you asked me to go back a long way it's been a i am there's a lot of years and a lot of drugs in between there men and oh my god we're getting on to the real juicy stuff and we're only five minutes in this is getting <laughs> great already um <laughs> to quote Alan Partridge, if you could. Um, yeah, I mean, it, he did the first two episodes and because Danny Danny Webb, I think you might have had a couple of scenes with who's a good, did, friend, yeah. good friend of mine and he's he's coming on here soon. Oh, um, right. Not tonight, but he'll, he'll be on. He's doing an interview with me in, in due course. Um, and I've been lucky enough to direct him a, a couple of times. Um, yeah, he said that he really liked the way Stuart worked with the camera and he brought him very close to the actors and it felt very intimate, but he got behind on the shooting schedule, so he got fired and was replaced um, uh, by, by somebody else who did the la last six episodes. Uh, right. So I think there was eight alter altogether. Did you watch the whole thing when it came out? Uh, did I watch the whole thing when it came out? Again, memory serves me wrong. I probably did not. Fair enough. Yeah, I know a lot of actors don't like sort of watching the stuff that they do. I don't, yeah. I'm... I'm Tend to be one of the I, unless I think it's a really good thing. I I I I I watch it just to see that I've done all right, and generally look at it. No, I didn't, uh, and then not look at it again unless it's something that, that is really sort of important. Well, I've, like, never... I've watched quite a few times. I don't sit at home watching it on my own. Though. No, well, I should hope not. <laughs> I'd be a bit worried if you did. But <laughs> sitting at home in a little darkened room. We've just looked stuff playing on my computer. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> I was I was an actor once. Yeah, he's doing it. I don't. Yeah, oh, I remember those. Anyway, um, I yeah, so I didn't. Yeah, I tend not to. Uh, you know, it is a bit like dwelling on stuff if you keep if you look. Back no, no, it. absolutely. I'm, well, we are. I mean, I mean, I know we're going back a ways. So if I mention any of these early things in your career, but you can't remember that, that's absolutely fine. I mean, you, you, you did quite a few sort of iconic um, TV shows early on in the early 90s. You did Birds of a Feather. You were on Red Dwarf. Um, you had a really tiny part as a mortuary assistant on one of my favourite shows of that era, which was Between the Lines. I really, yeah. really liked I, that, I think, with I Neil been, Pearson. Yeah, I've been so lucky, actually, in my career, to have been involved in a lot of Great stuff, like you say, iconic TV shows, iconic films, that, um, um, and some pretty strong theatre as well. Actually. And uh, I'm going to get to the theatre, but sticking with your early TV stuff, I think sort of one of the first shows you had where you were kind of a regular all the way through was Rumble. Do you remember Rumble with Brian Glover? I do, yes. Yes, I do remember that a lot. See, I've researched this. I've done this before. <laughs> um, and yeah, because that was with like um, Sarah Powell. You played a character called Melvin. Now, normally, if I see something and I watched it, bits of it will come back to me, or at least they used to before I had the brain damage. Now it's a bit harder. But um, so I can't picture this series at all. The only thing I've got to guide me is that it's got a three point seven review on IMDb, which is a bit worrying. But that's not very good, is it? Well, I mean. I mean, it, out of five or out of ten on IMDb. There's two. There's two reviews. Uh, six out of ten in the days before the curtain got ripped away is the headline for that one. And then one out of ten, the Strangler on TV. I, I I don't know what that means. I mean, what was it about? Can you can do you remember? It was it was um, it, it basically was about a troop of wrestlers, American style wrestling with a troop of British. Uh, rubbish wrestlers. I've done a few wrestling things, actually, think about it. Um, and, yeah, just them going around. Uh, they had, like, the big heroic wrestler character, like, um, played by Stephen Hartley, who was sort of 
Uh, and then uh, we had uh, Leslie Joseph was like the mum of it all. And Brian Glover was the, the head coach um, person. And yeah, it was just a, a comedy about wrestling, this wrestling troupe performing in tiny little venues around the country. And I was one of the two, two brothers who were the tag team. The, I forget what they were, as you said, Melvin something, right? Melvin and, and we were just these two very large, oh, the beefy boys, I think we were called. Right. And these two large wrestlers who, who were in their, in their pastime were um, in their day, like, day job, brother. They were builders. Melvin and Vernon, I think. Melvin and Vernon, yes. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember um, the yeah. do you remember the actor David Orca who was in that, who played the um ring announcer in all the matches? Remember oh, David no. Orca? No. Do you know him? I, I, I know certainly know of him. I've been trying to interview him. I'll show you his picture, just see if it provokes uh, your, uh, your your memory is very good. My memory apps actually is absolutely rubbish because i do a brain damage which affects my memory so it's not good but uh, it's better than yours because i've done less drugs than you clearly so <laughs> um so oh, that's, oh, that, yeah. that's I, I do recognize him yeah that's him in a bridge too far which is my favorite yeah. war film of all time which um the, my last guest uh peter was um first camera operator with the main unit yeah um, and yeah david was in that and I, I just noticed he had a small part in that so i did wonder if you might it's um, funny it's funny in this in this career that you like you remember people because of stuff they've done, or you don't know what they've done, but then you recognise their face because they were in such things like that. And yeah. all, I wouldn't know his name, and I don't know, and I do not recall, unfortunately, him on on um, on Rumble, but uh, I do remember him from from that because it's, it's such a great iconic movie. And that's the memory I have of him. Yeah, same. Not for 30 years later on some TV wrestling TV show. So b before we get on to um, Lockstock, and when we do, I'll, I'll actually will I'll get your book ready so we can give that a good plug for you. Just oh, got, very got, very got several five-star reviews on um, Amazon, which is yes. nice. You've got nine. That's almost as many as my 52 uh, five-star reviews for my novel, but I bet yours is selling better than mine is. Well, um, no, I wouldn't go that far. Well, I don't know. Um, it's just that, it's, it, you know, it's, it's such, it's getting blood out of the stone to get even friends to do a review for you. They always say they'll do it and they, they never do. Yeah. Um, so before you did Lockstock, which is a bit of a game changer because so many people saw it and it, mm -hmm. I guess it put you in a, the public consciousness as, Oh, that guy. And um, B, you know, that it does the does the same effect in the industry suddenly kind of when casting directors are having a conversation in a pub about who should we cast in this role well you know that guy that did that role in that thing when people can say that it brings you to the forefront of a conversation a bit easier in, yeah. in, in casting terms so i know that must have been a game changer what what thing did you do what job did you do prior to that that sticks in your memory the most as that was fun or i'm glad i did that one well, our friends in the north was definitely one of those. Yeah, definitely. my working, movie, with, working with Malcolm McDowell must have been like just. It I was. Mean, and I did a movie with him recently as well. Really? Uh, the it's on my reel. Uh, if we ever get to see it. Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> not with Malcolm, not but the film is. The film was called The Big Ugly. It was Vinnie Jones produ uh, produced it and stars in it. Uh, and Malcolm McDowell was like the big bad guy in it, the boss, the mob boss in in that. So uh, he didn't remember me though from from uh, from our friends in the north. Really? Yeah, you know he's kicked in, beaten up so many people in his career. It's like I was just another face, just another beating. Well, that's true, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it, I like that role because it was a little bit different for him. Yeah. You know, so there was yeah. it was a uh, bit of going back to sorry, going back to your question about what uh, the, what ones. Yeah. Uh, so one that really did stand out, and it started. It was a play at first uh, called Arrivederci Millwall. Film, yeah, uh, I remember that. In 1985 at the uh, Albany Empire in Deptford, uh, which my mate Johnny Moore, who I worked with on on my beautiful laundrette, got me in for, and um, did that. And then the writer went to film school, and uh, at the National Film School, and. They decided to make it into a, a short film, 
for the graduation project. The director was a guy called Charles McDougall, who now directs shitloads of TV over here. He, he directed the Hillsborough film, which was fantastic, yes. which a proper affected me and made me realise the truth of what happened. And then I would go on to write the Hillsborough play, which won me my first award. Ah, right. Small world, eh? And yeah. I never... I, I remember out of Dirty Millwall, but I, I never had Charles McDougall as the guy who directed it. So that's yeah, well, we did that, and that, that, that took a long time to shoot. It took nearly two years to shoot. Because uh, right. we had the... the where they, they, they did it a lot. They initially did a lot on Steadicam, and the footage was terrible. They couldn't use it. So they had to go from doing it in this allocated national film school time slot of a couple of weeks to shoot. They, they then had to reshoot the whole film on weekends, Sundays, when everybody was available, that sort of thing. So it just took a long time to get together and get done. But when they did get it done, uh, they meant they, it got sold to the BBC, uh, became a play of the week film on the BBC, something like that, and um, did, very, did very well. So um, that's one that really st sort of stuck with me for a lot, a lot of my career. Um, well, believe it or not, the whole film is on youtube is it i believe it is let me just have a look i'll, 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 show only, it now, I'll only show a little <laughs> bit i'll only I'm show a little bit because otherwise i'll get flagged for copyright and this will get taken off again ah, yes. well there i am baby me but um yeah i mean this is the movie um it's on just somebody else's that part there the show now that's the part i did on the stage show harry keller oh. a local nightclub bouncer drug dealer and then, but when they did the film, they said, Would you rather do, we want you in it more? Will you do one of the gang? Oh, there you are. There I am. Trying to get one shot of you. Um, well, look, we won't, we won't play any more of it, but it is on YouTube, people. In fact, I might even whack the link on for that. I'm going to watch that. I did watch it when it came out because I remember it's connected to the Falklands, isn't it? There's, there's something to do yeah. with the Falklands. The, like, the, the main character in it, the main character is, is like this tortured young football fan hooligan, uh, his older brother gets killed in the Falklands. That was uh, it. And, and they go yeah. to Spain to get to seek revenge for the death of, uh, of his brother and other people killed in the, Fal in the Falklands by the Spaniards. Not realising right. it wasn't Spain that we were at war with. No, indeed. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. that was the intelligence of a lot of people then. Um, unfortunately, it was. I, I remember it, you know, the front page of the Sun bashed the Argies. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Embarrassing, but true. Um, so, Arab Dirty Millwall. Well, check that out, people. It's on yeah. um, YouTube. You can watch the whole thing for and free. Been, uh, there's been a lot. There's been a lot of stuff I've done that uh, prior to Lockstock that I was very pleased with, um, and could have uh, could have been changing, but didn't. But then Lockstock yeah. came along, and it did. Well, let's um, talk about Lockstock, which I think I know about five actors that were in it, one of whom is my dear best friend, Jason Fleming, um, who was my first guest on the channel here. Uh, All right. Who I've had the pleasure of directing five times. I've written about 20 scripts for him and God knows what else. Um, you were talking to me about doing a film. Yeah. Or, you know, you, no, that's what, sorry, no, it wasn't me going to be in a film. You did that film, the, the Greek thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a film in Greece, not a film starring Nick the Greek. Um, yes, but yes. Uh, no, we did it. Um, in fact, it, it's uh, here. Um, that's The Journey. The Journey, that was it, yeah. Blu ray. Yeah. And there's Jason on the back. Yes. Very uh, enjoyable. Yeah, I mean, uh, you came to the premiere, didn't you? I did. Yes, you you moaned at me about how uncomfortable the seats were. I, I probably did, yeah. Probably yeah. you you didn't want to hear that, did you? Not particularly at the time, I have to admit. But uh, no, you know, no. I mean, um, I, I actually uh, I actually wanted to have it um, in Empire Screen One, and I could have sold it out twice over because uh, all the tickets went within forty eight hours, and um, but they had it was the opening week of Fury. And they, they, with Brad Pitt, and they wouldn't give me the screen. They said, we can't, it's booked in, and right. distributors won't. So the Haymarket was the only screen that I could get that was in central London that had enough seats for the demand. 
Right. What, what was really annoying was we had 50 seats for guests, i.e. press, agents, this, that and the other, put aside. And of those 50 people, all of whom said they were coming, only five turned up. So I could, yeah, have, had another, I could yeah. have had another 45 people in. Um, mm. And, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed the film. I had to rewrite it halfway through. And it, it went through a similar process to Ar Aradurchi Millwall. We, we shot half the film. We lost the lead actor who got cast in 24. I screamed out loud, Jesus Christ, I'm going to have to shoot this whole thing again with somebody else. And then yeah. I kind of went, that's the solution. And I looked at everything I had rewrote the script with all the footage that we had and broke the original character into three people and then created two parallel timelines and then made them cross over at the end as a twist. And Jason Fleming said I was the Houdini of scriptwriters in order to pull that off. So it's, it's amazing that I, I still only give it six out of 10 myself, but it's amazing that it kind of works almost. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I would have loved to have shot the original script and I wrote it for Jason and he was supposed to play the lead guy. Right. And we were all ready to shoot. And then he got cast in um, something with Antonio Banderas. He just had his twins and it paid 250 grand. And it's like, oh, you've got to go and do that job, mate, really. So, yeah, yeah. you know, but yeah, it was, uh, hey, these things happen. So, yes. um, yeah. So anyway, back to your career. Um, so how did you get on Lockstock? Um, what happened? How did, that all, how did that all start? Same way for any any job. I went for an audition. My, uh, my agent, Dallas yeah. Smith, at the time, called me up, said, got an audition for you. I sent, sent, sent the pages through. I uh, did it, went to Celestia Fox's office in Clapham. She was doing the casting. Sat down, did a reading with um, Guy, obviously, and uh, uh, Dexter was doing the lines off. He was doing the reading. Um, and that was that. Then they said, they didn't actually offer me the role, but they said, would you come in and do a screen test? So I did a screen test, reading, actually read at the audition and the film, and the screen test, sorry, for the role of Fleming, that, that Fleming did. Um, right, right, yeah. Tom. And uh, um, hence, a few of the hence a few of the references about him being fat or not being fat in Lockstock was because it was originally meant to be a bigger built person. Right, uh, but then, um, but then, yeah. So they offered the role to him, and then, and then asked me if I wanted to do Nick the Greek, and I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say no to a role, you know. Uh, no, and then we did it, and at the time of doing it, like I said, knew it was going to be a good film. It felt good, and there was a great, strong, fun atmosphere on the shoot, mainly be because of um, the fact that everybody on that shoot was somebody who, who wasn't anybody, so to speak. Um, they were just, we were all new to films uh, and big films. But I'm not, I mean, I'd done it acting wise and the actors, other actors had done stuff. But but the crew, Guy, Guy Matthew Vaughan had only produced one other film before that. Mm. Um, uh, Tim, uh, uh, Tim, Tim, the DOP, whose last name has left me. He was a, I'd never done movies. The sound guys had never done movies. Simon Hayes. They'd all done uh, pop promos and they'd worked with Guy and they, they were kind of a crew that had worked with Guy and they'd all just done pop videos and adverts and things. Prior right. to and so they all came into doing the film full of excitement, full of, yes, we're going to do this and we're going to change the fucking work way of doing filmmaking. We're going to change the world. And they did, actually. They did change the way films are made, some films. Yeah. Uh, uh, and the way stories are told. Um, the sto the, that story, how Lockstock is told of this whole mixture of people all come together. Uh, 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 I think he's, he, he definitely, definitely changed because after that, everyone was emulating um, Quentin Tarantino at that time. Everyone's trying That's, to copy. Yeah, because it was it was ninety eight, and I just come back to London in ninety seven. Pulp Fiction was ninety six, I think. Yeah, and um, yeah. yes. So when we shot it in ninety. 7, 96, 97. Um, the, uh, it was, it would have been, pulp. everyone was like, yeah, Pulp Fiction, that style, and lots of dialogue, lots of banter, and lots of talking. Well, he kind of combined that, but he, he shot it and, and cut it in a massively different way. Um, it has a very fast pace, like frenetic yeah. 
energy. And I think that's the, 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 yeah. the, the pop video uh, advertising. Adver, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but it worked. It, it, I mean, I heard it. Ch- I heard the narrative change quite a bit in the edit suite because, yes, of, as a result of that style, some things became apparent that were going to yeah, work. Yeah, there was one main character that just they cut out, cut out completely because oh, really it didn't fit. I guess it did just, yeah, yeah. Well, do you know which act? There was a whole, whole love relationship, uh, romance relationship between uh, um, uh, Ed, uh, Nick Moran's character, mm. and uh, uh, the sister of Winston, uh, Stephen. The guy with the Stephen, Stephen McIntosh's. Uh, Oh yeah, Stephen McIntosh. I was in he, Bugsy Malone with him. He had a sister, in right? The story, and that was the love thing between them two. And they cut. They they decided that that didn't work at all after a few test screenings and everything. And they cut oh. it right out. Cut it completely out. Which okay, is, interesting. Yeah, which was the uh, actress Laura Bailey. Okay, okay, yeah. And I've, I, funnily enough, the last time I was in Cannes, I was on the phone to, phone to Fleming. Yeah, and he walked straight in front of me, but Nick Moran. And I said, <laughs> yeah. Hang on, I've just seen a mate of yours. Let me get a picture with him, and I'll I'll send it to you. And he was just filming. He just shot that film about the record label or something, where he was filming it. Oh, um, yeah, uh, he directed it, didn't he? Yeah, um, is, is that has that been out yet? I don't think I've seen yeah, it. Yeah, it came out. Yeah, um, I need to watch that. I forget what it was called, but it was about the the the, the Telstar. That's right. Was, called, was the movie called Telstar? Might have been. Uh, it was I about mean, the song Telstar and the guy that made that uh, produced it and everything. Um, uh, and I know more about it because, or some some about it because my sister-in-law's friend was the drum, the original drummer on on the song. Okay, Telstar, the Joe Meek story is the one. That's it. Yeah, Joe Meek. My apologies, I, I got confused. Probably not for the first time. Um, that. Yes, he did make that, but the one he was making at at the time was right. this was just a couple of years ago. Oh right, must have been Creation Stories that's on his IMDb, uh, the unforgettable tale of the infamous Creation Records label, Alan McGee. Oh. See, I knew it was to do with the record label. Right, um, right, right. the one one written off young Glaswegian upstart uh, rose irrevocably to change the face of British music culture. Written by Irving Welsh, starring oh. starring Ewan Bremner. So that's the one, that's the one he was shooting when I met met him. Um, I see, right. No, I haven't seen it yet. I don't think it's come out yet, has it? Uh, oh, it's been reviewed oh. though. It's been reviewed. No, maybe well, it hasn't. I'll have to I'll have to try and track that down. All um, the reviews from one of his mates who've got. A bit so when curious. when you when you saw the premiere of Lockstock, going back to it, did you? watch it and go kind of wow this is a game changer did it have yeah. that impact to me yeah yeah i mean the whole event of the premiere was just that in its in itself never mind the actual film just that whole hollywood style premiere was insane um may just may just go hang on there's something this is different this isn't just your average film there's something bigger about this than than we're expecting and then Go it. We went in, and there was various events during that premiere that, um, like Nick Moran, nearly getting arrested for punching one of the. Um, Do tell what happened exactly. Oh, Nick! Uh, Nick was getting his photographs done, right? Uh, uh, standing out there, the press are going, Nick, 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 and then Dustin Hoffman tried to walk in behind him without getting noticed. Not going to happen. Right. So Nick, Nick's still there, and then they go. They just go straight from him and go, "Oh, Dustin, 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 Dustin," and uh, and some bloke, one of the photographers, says, um, "says," and I'm repeating the story I've been told. I don't know if this is fully accurate, mm. um, but it's it's it, it, it. It was when I was doing my book research. I've, I've got this story. Um, he said he tried to push Nick out of the way. He said, "Get out of the way, you can." To which Nick said, "Do you know who I am? And this is my fucking movie. You fucking whacker." Knocked him out. Well, I didn't knock him out, but punched him. And um, <laughs> uh, spent, like, was immediately rushed off and spent, like, the next sort of half an hour hiding in a broom cupboard away from the police and everybody. 
<laughs> actually, they, hid him, they hid him in a cupboard in the in the in the theatre so that he didn't actually get nicked then. And then uh, they did finish the premiere, and then uh, somebody uh, took him down to the police station, and and he he, he fessed up. Let's mention your book um, as you segued very nicely for me into it there. <laughs> so have a butcher's. See, I've got it all ready here. See, the making of lock, stock, and two smoking barrels. Um, mm -hmm. It's got five stars out of five so far. Uh, available in paperback for a mere four pound eighty. Although there are twelve used copies for ninety five pence on uh, Amazon, according to. <laughs> don't buy a used copy. Get a brand uh, brand new one. Um, because Stephen will sign it for you. But, um, I mean, these reviews are rather nice, and, I mean, I, I'm assuming that at least three or four of them are not from your mates. Um, and uh, that's what I always used to say when people asked me about my reviews. I said I've got 55 stars out of five, and 10 of them are from people I don't know. Um, <laughs> it, it's been emotional. If you like the film, this book is worth your time. I enjoyed reading this, the story behind the film, told firsthand by Stephen Marcus, in quotes from everyone else involved. I think that tells you all you need to know. You got storyboards and production stills in it as well, I think. Yeah, That's Tim right. Morris, Tim Morris Jones, bang, just came back. Tim Morris Jones, the DOP, uh, provided a lot of those photographs and storyboards. That's very uh, kind of him. Yeah. Thank you very much for doing that. That's available now and it's on Kindle as well. So if you're a big fan of the movie, do us a favor, support Stephen because you know the cafe Lappuccinos are not cheap in LA and he needs a few pennies. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and especially the price of petrol, also not very. Uh, oh, don't, don't get me started on that one, sir. Ah, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I can imagine it's a nightmare. I'm coming out there, but thank God I don't drive, sort of. Uh, um, which in which in America is a massive, massive handicap if ever there was one. Um, so um, sticking with, I mean, so that obviously. What 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 no, what difference did you notice in terms of like casting phone calls your agent were getting after Lockstock? Did it have a huge oh, impact? I mean, yeah, straight away. Really? Like, yeah, pretty much straight away. And when it actually came out, I was on tour with doing a play at the National. Uh, Cleo Camping, Emmanuel, and Dick. The story of the behind uh, the scenes of Carry On. Yeah, yeah. Which was also made into a film. It was yes. Which is also on YouTube and people can watch it. It's and it's called. Um, I'm not in the film. You no, you're not because I've I've seen the film version recently. Shapiro, isn't it? Plays um, um, Barbara Barbara Windsor. Uh, Shapiro, the girl that played her in the play. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, she plays her in the film. I'm trying to remember her name now. But anyway, yeah. So you're yeah. in that play. You're in that play doing that tour. I was, doing that, I was, on, I was on tour and then. Um, uh, I know all these things around the film were happening, like you know, awards events and things, which I was missing out on totally because I was like up in Newcastle or wherever doing uh, doing uh, two two shows a day, um, and uh, so I was missing out on that. But but in terms of uh, 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 castings and stuff, and I, I did get immediately like I I got called up uh, and a straight offer to go and do a film with. My inspiration, Alan Parker. I did the uh, the uh, the uh, oh god, the Irish movie he did uh, uh, with. Um... We'll find it. Don't worry. Oh, um, my memory is so bad. Well, don't worry. Mine is pretty bad as well. So between us, so he did Midnight Express, which, as you said, was one of those films that inspired you when you yeah. were younger. Yes. Um, so if you worked with him around the time after Lockstock, I mean, he did, he did a Vita in 96. Wasn't that? No. Uh, no. Angela's Ashes, it would have been. Angela's Ashes. Thank you. Yes. It just was. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I just got a call saying straight off. Do you want to go and do this film? And it wasn't a, a huge part or anything like that. It was just one scene. A couple uh, of scenes. And that was with Robert Carlyle. Robert Carlyle. Yeah. 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 I, I bumped into him on the street in Dublin when they were filming this um yes. I, was, I was late to um to meet my friend in a pub and i couldn't find the pub and i saw a guy standing in the shadows and he clocked me looking at him and he deliberately stepped out of the light because i thought there's a guy who looks like a local i'll ask him and he must have thought that guy's just recognized me and i hadn't and then i went closer to speak to him and i thought fuck it's robert carlisle and oh. um a friend of mine did a scene 
uh, with him, an actor called Stephen Walters, who does that National Front kind of scene. Uh, when it was kind of like a far right guy, he's talking right, to the crowd. Yeah, yeah. Um, they did that scene together. Anyway, he's uh, very pleasant to me. Which which character did you do in in um, I, was, I was I was called the English agent. That's who was a uh, uh, like a kind of sluggish type of bloke, getting people to come. The guys were all, the, the, all the men were leaving Dublin, except we shot in uh, Cork. Uh, yeah. To go on the boat back to work in England, and I was the the, the representative from England. Okay, who was just hassle, harassing people to get a move on and get on the boat and things. And it was nice. It was very nice. And it was I done I I'd done another. That was another thing. Suddenly things flood back, jump back. Did a film with Alan Parker before that actually. Um, he did a he did a. There was a series of documentaries just about when I was doing my, in '85, doing my beautiful laundrette for film mm. four, where they got film directors and producers to do little documentaries and talk about their own uh, films and influences and things. Yeah, Alan I, think I, re- I think I remember the show you're talking about actually. Yeah, he did. He did one. It was called A Turnip Ed's Guide to British Cinema, and I portrayed what may have been him. I don't know if it was him. But this kind of football thug, skinhead thug, who decided he wanted to become a film director. And there was just talking to camera as his character about like that. And that was, yeah, Alan Parker. Alan Parker's had a big influence on my career. I wish he was still around, still doing it. Yeah, we lost him in um, 2020. And mm. um, he, uh, it's so weird that my good friend, Graham Fletcher Kirk, who was the boss <coughs> inspired us to start the outcast creative graham and dexter fletcher of course both worked with him at quite a young age on bugsy malone right Um, and they they the three of them reunited with him um for for i think it was the 40th or 50th anniversary of bugsy malone there's Mm -hmm. a there's a a really nice picture of the three of them together and it was so weird that graham was the the first of the three of them to go you know uh and then alan i think alan went yeah alan went the following following right. year but he i mean i thought mississippi burning was oh. his, his best movie some people would disagree but i i, I personally think that's his best yeah. film i think Ang- he, he did An- some great films angel oh, heart yeah. angel heart that was him yeah. wasn't it yeah with um robert de niro robert de niro and mickey rock yeah yeah probably 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 one of rock's best performances i would argue as well yeah really really I mean, good and there's, there's a man who Ruined his good looks. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we can't all be blessed with your looks, Stephen. So I know. Um, it's you know, there's God only had so much magic dust to go around that um, day, and he, and he put a lot of it on me. Yeah, all of my, my, my I got the crumbs at the bottom. You know, all the bits that stick together at the bottom of the box. That's that's, that's where I came from. So, <laughs> um, uh, so okay. So after Lockstock, you you're doing your tour. Which part did you play in that Carry On thing? Uh, I played, uh, I forget the name of him, but he was an amalgam of, uh, sort of, he was kind of meant to be Ronnie Knight, but he wasn't. Oh, Barbara Windsor's fella. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 But he, 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 apparently, I don't know if this is true, but when Terry uh, Terry Hall wrote it, directed it, mm. uh, he decided, he, 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 I think he got a bit threatened. And no, he I, did. He got. He did get threatened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All oh, right. Yeah, he's got, right. basically he got he got cornered by him and said, if if you put me in this play and you use my real name, I'm going to break your fucking legs. So, okay. You know. Yeah. So. Yes, uh, I'd, I'd heard that. I yeah, I've been, I've been I've been told so, that by yeah, someone who so knew. That was who I was. I was this kind of fictional character who wasn't even her husband in the play. He was uh, a, 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 a henchman. Right. Saying the husband's words, but you know, I think when I think when the film when they did the film version, I think because Ronnie Knight's passed away now, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I might Google just to check because I don't want anyone coming around my house. But um, I think in the film version, I think they were a bit more explicit about him. Right, might have even used his real name, but right, the the film version was called Core Blimey. Ah. The film version was called Core Blimey because that's what they used to say in the Carry On films all the time. Core Blimey. Yes. Um, and uh, 
Yeah, but and I, I think the actress who played Barbara Windsor, I don't know if she went on tour with you. What's, well, yeah, I'm, it's the same woman. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, I'll, I'll, I'm have just you got gonna, her up? Yeah, I'm just checking it now. Because Terry Johnson, wasn't it, who... Terry Johnson, what's that? Terry Horse from the special. <laughs> Terry Johnson, sorry, yeah. Did you also play the Bernard Breslau character in the play version? Uh, no. No, he wasn't. I was, was he in there? No. I don't yeah, think he, was well, he was in. He was in the film version. He played. Yeah, by I don't Steve. think he was in. If I recall rightly, he wasn't in the play version. Steve so Steve was, Spears. Steve Spears played him in the film. Yeah. Adam Adam Godley played Kenneth Williams. He's a cracking actor. Adam played. Um, Adam played. Um, played it in um, on the stage as well. And Samantha Spiro. That's who I meant. Not Shapiro. Sam, Spiro. Yes, yeah, Sam Spiro. Played Sam Spiro. Barbara. And I I met her. Um, in well, one of my friends took me to one of these actor bar places after after the theatre place where everybody goes for a private drink, and she was there with a load of her mates, and I just watched Call Blimey like literally the night before. Not I'd seen it before, but I just happened to watch it again. So I got to say to God, I just watched that again. You were so good in that. Uh, I love the scene where she's coming up to the old gate at Pinewood, and the security man's watching the television. And she sees Sid James's picture comes up on the TV, and she just knows he's died because that's the only reason this picture would be on the TV at that at that time. Yeah. And it's, quite, it's quite sad. They all had quite tragic lives, didn't they? Though? They did. All yeah. of them had tragic lives. I mean, you know, Kenneth I mean, Williams was very, very tragic. Uh, Hattie Jakes, she had a. I mean, she hers was tragic in the, in the sense of she always wanted to be a proper actress. Yeah. Classical yeah. actress and never got the chance to be. Made a fortune out of, of being Hattie Jakes. But yeah. She was never happy about that. No, I Charles think. Haltry. Charles Haltry uh, raging, raging. I don't know why he was tortured, drinking. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, again, kind of, repre you know, he was a homosexual when you couldn't talk about that sort of thing. And yeah. it was illegal. And um, yeah, I mean, he had a. Yeah, that's, very big tragic story. It's a shame, really, because they were like an iconic thing in anyone's house on TV when you were young, and you just you didn't have an inkling, did you, that all this was no, going? You look at all the great, uh, great comedians. They were they've all been tortured. Um, people, and I, I don't know why that is, but they are. They've all got some kind of yeah, yeah, big deep skeletons in their closets. I uh, we should also actually we haven't mentioned him, and we definitely should give a. Shout out because I think he passed away not that long ago. To yeah, he did the late great Jeffrey Hutchins who played um Sid James. Didn't he do a cracking job? He did, um, yes. Yeah, he, he did was... it. He, he did it. We had two, 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 two uh Sids actually. Jeffrey started it. He did it because he did it originally at the national and then came out on the I think it was the first week of the tour or first first few venues and then um Chris. Um, Chris, 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 who is brilliant and a lovely man. Uh, uh, where am I? I'm looking up a film and I, it will remind me of. I'm looking up my own films and there's a film I did that's not other. Oh, is it's um, um, film film I did recently that I did I did with Chris and I'll give me his last name. Um, Jeffrey Hutchins was in Our Friends in the North, of course, and that's the yes, first was, thing I, yeah. that's yeah. the first thing I ever saw him in, and he was brilliantly, deliciously seedy in that. You know, we've yeah. got a, we've got a lovely one of these buildings in Bordeaux. If you want to come and see it for a free expenses paid holiday, that's yeah. Uh, that's Chris Fairbank is the person Chris I'm thinking of. Right, right, right. Was, yeah, that, uh, that was great. Also, did a they, they, he did a very very good version of Seed. So. Um, from torturous stars to Star Hunter, your own personal torture. Um, <laughs> you were on it, were you? I don't remember that. <laughs> well, I've watched really a lot weird. of it. I've watched a lot of it in the last. Uh, I watched. I watched the trailer for the latest um, uh, series, um, and I, I tried to get a couple of episodes of it. Now, I mean, you've done so. This we're moving into more recent things, um, but this is a sci-fi show. It is, yeah. That you've been in and out of a few times well yeah yeah technically uh no I, it, it started the first season i think was mid 90s can't remember exactly when I'll, I'll and you, but... i did 
2000, 2000 to 2004. Uh, okay. was the, yeah, was the first, right. well, according to IMDb, um, 44 episodes, and it began in the year 2000. Maybe it started shooting in 1999. Yeah, maybe. Um, but yeah, that was um, that was. Uh, it was it, it's a sci-fi show. It's basically before Firefly came along. It's the same yeah. thing, a group of space bounty hunters hunting down every every episode, hunting down various criminals, space criminals. And right. um, I played the, basically the guy, I was kind of like the Charlie of Charlie's Angels. You, you had me speak on video, send it, telling them each week, right, the person you're looking for this week is Bob Smith, who's uh, X, Y, and Z, and then give my own little personal philosophy on life as well. Right. That was, the first season was that. That was me on video. Shot that all in about a week in a studio here in in what is now the Westfield. It's under the Westfield. Uh, there was a, a studio right next to that. Uh, yeah, sorry, do you mean the Westfield in the UK, or are you yeah, talking Shepherd's about Bush. Shepherd's Bush? Yeah. Are you in the UK now, or are you in LA at the moment? I'm in LA now. Yeah. Okay. You were so like I mean, you were like pointing that way, like it was out the window, and I was thinking it doesn't yeah. mean literally just down there past Hollywood. Well, okay. it's, you know, it's just down there. 12 hour flight. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> jump on a puddle um, jumper, you're there in no time. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, right. Well, yeah. okay. uh, so that was first season. Second season came along and um, they wrote my character into being on the spaceship uh, and traveling with them. So uh, they rewrote the whole concept of the series. <coughs> and um, uh, yeah, shot that uh, um, in Toronto for seven months. Which is wonderful, fun, joyous, uh, and then the third series is not a third series as such. It's a rehash of the first, second, first and second. Because what happened was when the first series when it came out, they I don't know why, but there were some financial reasons. Bank had to be called in, called in. Uh, the Bond people were called in, and the creators had the show taken away from them and given to these other two people who uh, turned it into a very commercial thing. More than it was, right? Since then, the uh, the original producers got money, got their rights back to it and everything, and they've re-edited it now into a third series called Star Hunter Redux, where they've added some some more effects and a couple of scenes reshot or added a few scenes, uh, and then and re-released it with the view to using that to raise money to make properly make a third series. Okay, so. I think I've got that. So Star Hunter Redux, which is on IMDb from 2017 to 2018, and that's some of what I watched uh, yeah. yesterday. That's it's the same as season. It's pretty a much a reshoot of the original show. Yeah, it's, right. it's just a rehash, uh, uh, and, and they recut it to tell change the storyline in season two a little bit, right. uh, and just new effects and things using modern Because I watched the trailer for it. And I've got to be honest, I really like the effects work. The ship was very, you know, if you're going to do a show, um, the main premise is guys going around in a ship doing adventures. The ship's got to look cool, you know, because you're going up yeah. against Millennium Falcon for this kind of thing. So you want a ship that people like, oh, yeah, that's the ship from that show. And that all that stuff looked really good. In fact, I, I was quite impressed by the, uh, CGI, which these days is quite difficult to make look fresh and original without it just looking sterile, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but then there are two young actors in it. I don't know where they fit in it. I didn't uh, see any. I don't think there's, I think there's well, like one, two second clip of you in the trailer for what is this Redux version. And um, I watched the whole trailer and I didn't, I didn't get anything about what, what is this version about? I just, there was nothing there that told me what the show was. It felt like it was, wasn't was a trailer for public consumption. It sh felt like it was a, a reel for a distributor saying, here's a load of stuff from the show. And maybe that's what it was. Maybe maybe it was that yeah. reel. But that's the reel that's on YouTube, which the public are going to see. So right. I, I felt that they could have cut something together that, yeah, these are great effects. But what's the story? I You know, this because the story for yeah, me... In that know, they, may have, they may have recut something recently because... They've just sold it. I uh, got a new distribution deal with um, some German-based company, uh, 
and they may well have done a maybe doing another tweak to the to the trailer. I don't mm. know. Not involved with that side of it, unfortunately. Do, do you do you do you like doing science fiction? I mean, it's a specific genre. Some people like it, some people don't. I, I do actually. Yeah, I quite like it. I, quite, I like watching a bit of sci-fi, and um, and I and I yeah, I enjoy I enjoyed being in it. It was fun. What's your What's your favourite sci-fi show? Um, oh, well, I do like Star Wars a little bit. The original trilogy, I hope. Yeah. Yes. Although the some of this TV stuffs looking all right, I haven't seen much of it. I saw the 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 Mandalorian. Saw some of that. I, I quite like the Mandalorian. Yeah. Kenobi, not so much. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any of that yet. Well, I wouldn't. You know, there's probably other things you should watch first. If uh, Star if Trek limited. as well. I do like Star Trek, the originals. Yeah, I like. Yeah, I like the original I TV like, show. They were, they, were, they were. It was only one or two seasons. Talking of, uh, as a segue for maybe a bit early, but um, Star Trek the original with the original cast. It was only shot mm. for one, one. Was it one or two seasons? I think it was. They did three. Was it three? Right. Um, three, three, three for the TV series, and there was six, seven, six original movies with the original cast. The seventh was a crossover with the next generation. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I've got one of them in my film that I'm trying to get made. Oh, one of the one of the original cast. The original cast. I have Walter Koenig, Mr. Chikoff. I'm I'm told that he's a really nice guy. So. I have not met him yet. Oh. My writing partner, uh, producing partner, Frank, uh, is is very very close with him. But he's old. He's eighty three. Mm. There's been a pandemic, so I haven't actually had the chance yet to actually meet him face to face yet. Um, but apparently, called my friend Frank, he's lovely. He's a diamond gazer. Very good. Did. He did a low-budget indie sci-fi film about um, a kind of robot virus uh, called Moontrap that came right. out, I think, around 90, 89, 90. And it's not a bad little movie. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And um, it's him and another geezer on a space shuttle, and they bring back what looks like an alien egg, which, as we know from Ridley Scott, you should never pick up and bring back on your spaceship. <laughs> But it's actually a robot egg that then taps itself into systems and becomes bigger. And um, it's it's a nice little cool cool film. Um, if you can track that down, that will give you a good eye uh, because he's the lead, so you can see what else right. he can do. Um, well, this, I mean, my film is uh, not a sci-fi at all, and he's he's going to be playing my father, who's uh, got Alzheimer's uh, and uh, is dying from cancer. The last ferry. The last ferry. That's a, a a film that uh, probably not going to happen. It's oh, that's one, of those, sure. one of those IMDb ones where somebody says, "Will you do it?" And we shot a a, a short version of it with Stephen Meyer, right. um, uh, and um, it's been so long. I mean, that's like fifteen years ago when we did that. I'm pretty right. sure. So I have a feeling. Much as one would like it to happen, I have a feeling it's probably not going to. No, oh, shame. Stephen Graham is uh, phenomenal, and I'm also told very lovely to work with as well. Yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah I've done enough. God, I, it almost seems like me and him have crossed paths so many times now. We've, we've, we've been everything together, but it's actually not. We've only probably about three or four films together. So, but, yeah, going back a little bit seeing as I've got it on the title that's scrolling past here. You also did a show called Cave Girl. Oh, yeah. 2002. I've got a vague memory of it. Um, but, I mean, tell me about it. Cave Girl. Um, I, kind of, I can't even think what it was like. Because Lucinda, Lucinda Rhodes Th Thackra was in it, and she's a producer yeah. now. She's a big producer. She's getting really doing really well now. Yeah, it's uh, Scanner Road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, Stacey Cadman. Uh, basically, just a, it was a kids show, um, and doing all sorts of modern kid problems and issues like boyfriends and music and all that sort of stuff, but in cave times. Um, so it's kind of like a sort of serious version of the Flintstones, but not animated. Well, not even serious. No, it was definitely comical. Um, 
and not am animated. Yes, we were real. In it fact, was great it was great fun. I got to shoot, went out to South Africa, lived in a tent for six months, uh, shared it with spiders and snakes and gibbon, baboons rather, not gibbons. I mean, was that your actual accommodations while you were? Oh, it was actually our accommodation, yeah. You, you was, lived in tents, really, when you were filming? We it. lived in nice tents. But nice yeah. tents. Yeah, well, as long as it's a nice tent. <laughs> <laughs> it was like that we went because the location was um remote three hours from anywhere right and, and uh, it was the, well it was three hours from cape town on normal roads and then once you got off of off the road you had an hour's journey from our campsite to the actual location on tracks. so uh it was just not practical to stay anywhere other than on almost on the set uh, but I mean, uh, I mean, what, what about like, what did they, did they bring out portable shower blocks and toilet blocks and things? Yep. I yep. mean, you didn't have to dig a hole in the the, the bushes with the snakes and the spiders, presumably. Uh, no, no, but I, I have my I have my own tent with my own shower. Right. Okay. And everything. And that, um, that must have been a kind of cool, but also quite surreal uh, experience. Uh, you know, it, it was because at night you. At night, you would literally be like lying there and, and you'd wake up and you'd just feel something rustle along the side of the tent on the outside. Oh, you know, oh, an occasional, <laughs> like, I don't know, a lion or something has just wandered past you. Oh, you know, um, the DOP coming back from too many beers. but um... There was that as well. There was a few of those times. Um, we, we Because we were so secluded from uh, everywhere, once a week, we would, on our Saturday day off, we would go into the nearest town, which is a one saloon town. Right. Uh, uh, and just get absolutely wankered. Like, we'd, we'd end up doing shots of... Yeah. Uh, it's called Apple Sour, which was some South African apple snaps type drink. Right. You know, there, was, uh, there was one There was one night where uh, the director and the producer bought shots for everybody and nobody wanted them. So they would just end up with the two of us going, oh, yeah, that's right. Hello. Hello. About twenty or thirty, anyway, and we were wankered, um, totally blitzed. Um, but yes, living in the tent was because there was no there was no structure, there was no buildings to live in. That's, um, I mean, I, I, it must have made for a great camaraderie, um, you know, among the crew, and uh, I, I just, I think when you're all in it, if if there's a good atmosphere, the work ethic. Everybody mm. being away and together, in some ways, is a lot better than shooting um, something yeah. in a hotel. You know, um, I think really, I mean, I've done. You've probably done. I've done a few things where it's like that, where you're you're locked away in the middle of nowhere, shooting, and mm. everybody's there. And it does. It does. You do bond, and you do get a bit of camaraderie. Um, in fact, it's probably you get more camera more camaraderie than than being locked away in a in the middle of a city shooting because mm. you, when you're on shooting you shoot 16 17 18 hours a day don't you? you shoot long hours uh mm. and and then you sleep and you get up and you shoot again and that's all you do and if you're on set in a tent miles away it's kind of okay because there's nothing else to do and nobody moans about it but when you're in a city and you're doing that same thing I think people get a tendency to get a little bit more frustrated because they can see and feel their social life or other life offset, but they can't reach it because they're too busy on set. Right. Yeah. No, I, 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 yeah, no, I, I get all of that. Um, just picking up on other work you kind of did, you know, early 2000s, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Did Light Rise to Candleford, which is a bit of an iconic show that everybody remembers. Yep. Kingdom, but I'm guessing that's not the Danish series, The Kingdom. No, that was with Stephen Fry. Yeah, right. And then you did an episode of Doctor Who, which no doubt would have got you at least 100 letters to your agent saying, can I have an autograph photo, please? Out of you, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, everyone who does like one line, you just have to do one line on Doctor Who, and within yes. a week there'll be a sack full of mail because there are all these people out there who want signatures of everybody that's, you know, you could yeah. be you could be man with gun in background, Delton guard or something, and they still want your autograph. <laughs> um, 
and then Kinky Boots, which of course was also made into a, I think it was a musical as well. In fact, I think it was on at the same theatre, the Adelphi that you trod the no, stage. Did. Yes, it, no, yes, it, it went after we did Bodyguard. It came in. That's right. Um, of those of those shows mentioned, uh, any particular memories of any of those? Um, Kingdom. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, all of them. Like, right, I'm glad you got it running along the bottom of the screen here. It's, it's yeah, it's great, isn't it? There you go. <laughs> I know. Told you, we've, um, done this, we've done this before. Pro professional setup here. Mark Rice um, was very enjoyable because I, they, I, I only did one season of Mark Rice, and my character kind of disappeared after the second episode. They stopped right. writing, so I ended up being. Pretty much an extra, a background supporting artist. Um, like in one episode, I literally did nothing for the whole episode except stand there and hold a horse. And um, but the great thing was, I was the highest paid background artist ever. <laughs> <laughs> I got a got really, I got a full regular TV episode uh, uh, fee, um, but I only had to do like half a day's work every month every episode right fantastic. so that's what i remember about that one and it was in a lovely location down in uh, near bath um kingdom love that up in uh up in uh, uh the north near norfolk uh mm. Stephen Fry had a nice little part nice part in that three episodes uh and just it was nice and i've been stay friendly with Stephen fry since so that's that's nice as well doctor who um the only yeah. memory, I mean, future memories of that. I think you were, a mort you were a mortician or something in that. I was a jailer. I was that a jailer was in, uh, and it was shot in a underneath a market in Newport. Right. Uh, which it, is, yeah. um, nice. Uh, Kinky Boots, remember that? Because um, I just come back, I came straight back from Canada, having shot a movie there called The Greatest Game Ever Played, uh, with mm. the late, late and brilliant Bill. Uh, Paxton. Paxton, uh, uh, that's one of my topics. Maybe we'll come on to that next. But yeah, continue. But um, yeah, just uh, I'd come back from that, and I'd uh, prior to going to Canada to shoot uh, shoot that movie, I met my wife uh, like two weeks before I flew to Canada, and uh, she said, uh, uh, and I said, I'm going off to do a movie. If you ever if you're out that way, fancy come on, you know, pop out and see us. So she, she worked for a Canadian company, and so she got called out a couple of times. So she came to visit, and we became lovers and became husband and wife and came straight back to doing Kiki Boots after that. Uh, shooting up in with um, Chewy. Chewy yeah, until... Yeah. Chewy, Chewy Edgefour, yeah. Edgefour, and... Uh, uh, you, um, not you, and Um... Oh, I'd have to check, but uh, yeah, quite a, quite a strong um, cast in in that. I want to say uh, Ewan, but it's not, is it? It's no. Uh, I know. I know who you're thinking of. Um, I don't have the link ready because I was about to click on Lark Rise to Candleford because there was. Um, I'm, I'm speeding my way through it here again. Kinky Boots page. Um, Joel Edgerton. Joel Edgerton. Yeah. Joel Edgerton. So. Um, uh, that was that was that was a really nice little film and um, and just you know there's a strong memory as well of cementing my relationship with my wife. Who was you, my wife to me at that time? You got to work with Brendan Coyle on Lark Rise to Candleford. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, he's a he's a character and fun to hang out with. I've <laughs> met met him. Um and you also got to work with Victoria Hamilton, who used to be practically my neighbour, her and Mark, um yeah. her husband Mark. Uh, used to live right around the corner from me. All right. Um, Mark Baisley. And um, bless him, when I slipped over on the ice and broke my arm, I think it was about 2008, he went with me to the supermarket to help me bring back my shopping because I couldn't carry it. Um, oh, what a nice man. Very sweet of him, yeah. Victoria Hamilton, uh, they're both cracking actors. She's done some great stuff on telly lately, and I'm thinking oh, she's kind of nicely segueing into the next Judy Dench, I think. Um, and, you know, that's a, and those are big shoes to fill. Let's face it. So that's a, that's a big compliment to give out. I well, I think it's deserved because uh, and they're both really lovely 
people as well. I had a nice beer in, in their garden one, one summer and yeah, very, very lovely kids. I used to take their kids as little Christmas presents and whatnot. Um, so, um, moving on, yeah. uh, you then, okay. So I will talk about, I don't know why I've lumped these together because bodyguard and fast and furious six don't really match up, but <laughs> let's, let's just talk about the bodyguard quickly. Um, before we jump onto fast and furious six. So, Bodyguard, um, theatre production. You've done quite a bit of film and theatre at, at that but stage. Actually, that's no, I haven't. <laughs> I, so, I don't mean to, to correct you, but um, in that in that way. But I, I most of my career has been in film and television. So, no, uh, the, yeah, that's what I meant. I meant uh, by the sorry. By I've the time you, by the time you did the the Bodyguard, you had mainly done film and TV. It's yeah. quite unusual for an actor to go back and do theatre for a long run at that time, but you did. And I just wondered what the yeah, motivation was, for that was. No, or... the, 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 the motivation was it was a job. Um, okay. and, and, and I thought, I actually would like to have a long run at something. Not yeah. done it. Always terrified of it before. Always like, mm. and as an actor in film and television, you get used to just like learning, doing two, three scenes or whatever, uh, uh, in a show and, and that's all you need to memorise is just enough for that and just enough to get through that take uh, Yeah, theatre uh, does keep you on your toes doesn't it? Keep yeah. you on your toes uh, it, was, it was like, I want to do, I want to get back and do some theatre uh, and that came along, it was the most bizarre audition I don't know if you've ever seen an episode of Friends yeah. where, where Joey uh, Tribbiani goes to audition and, and there's uh, and there's all the Joeys sitting around. No, no, the one it's a it's a dance audition, and he's lying on his resume saying that he trained at Juilliard uh, and blah blah blah. Yeah, and the, and the the choreographer who's holding the audition has, has to be gets called away, so he turns to him and says, "Joey, you take over the audition. You've got all this experience. You take over and uh, and it, and and run the routine." And he ends up doing this kind of really bad routine and ends up with a jazz hands. Um, and I kind of felt like it was that for me because I went to this for the bodyguard, went to audition at Pineapple Dance Studios. <laughs> yeah, okay. Surrounded by dancers. Yeah. Um, Making by... you feel very unhealthy with their, <laughs> you know, newborn sort of limbered bodies. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and my newborn limbered body wasn't there. Not that day. <laughs> it was on um, holiday. I, I, I'd taken the wrong body to the audition. Uh, oh. Yeah, I just had a vision of me standing in the middle of this dance studio and then say then saying right now you lead the routine Stephen please and I'm like no oh. but fortunately that didn't happen I didn't well, have to do any dancing or singing I just did the job did the audition and got the job yeah and the nice thing about that job was was that show was actually failing badly uh when we all got cast they they we're going to close we, the show completely. Well, you were you were like the second cast to come in. The second cast, yeah. Right. The show was wasn't selling out, selling well, wasn't right. doing well at all. So they were going to they were going to close it. The producers wanted to close it, but the theatre said we've got nothing to refill. We don't want to go dark. We've got nothing to come in. You keep keep the show, and we'll pay we'll pay half the cost. Blah, blah, something like that. Whatever the deal was. They did a deal. Yeah. <laughs> they did a deal, and so they cast us all, and they cast Beverly Knight. As uh, as as um, Rachel, the yeah, the Whitney. and um, she was just fucking amazing. So we she were like, supposed to be a caretaker cast, but then Bev was just fucking so good, uh, so so good. Uh, 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 the, the, the audiences started coming and just kept coming. Word got out, and these audiences, and we ended up instead of closing the show, we sold out for nearly a year. Just sold out. And the film and the show is still going now. It's out on tour. Um, Alexander Burke took over. And the from producers Bev. clapped their hands with glee over the deal they made with the theatre for half yeah. the cost. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. I mean, um, the, the girl who played the sister, and I follow her on Twitter, and her name escapes me, was also fucking great. Pardon my yeah. French. Uh, can Everybody you remember was, her the, name? The cast was really good. I uh, no. <laughs> But she was she was really good. So whoever you were, Stephen and I both think you were amazing. Uh, we're, we're old aging men, so you'll have to forgive us with our memories. But um, yeah, I, I, I remembered 
finding her on Facebook. And I, I, I said, I'm not going to send you a friend request. I just want to send you a message. You were really, really good. And, you know, it made it quite, it was quite long sort of yeah. from a, from a director's POV. Uh, yeah, I remember it was packed the night I came. It was packed out the night I, I came. I mean, all the, all, even all the uh, supporting cast, the understudies, the dancers, everybody was spectacular. Everybody was really, really good. Um, I don't know, maybe they did pull a fast one. And, and, and actually, we were all cast because we were very good. And they knew that. Or, 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 and they knew that it, we would be able to lift the show and make it a big success again. That's what I, I would like to probably, think. A, probably a little bit of everything and a, a bit of luck. <laughs> a, a bit yeah. of luck and, uh, you know, don't catch COVID now. Um, so... Oh, you're as bad as my wife. Every time you cough, it's like COVID. I know. Well, I've, I've just done a test, but uh, fortunately... Uh, my test was negative. There we go. There you go. See? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's funny, no, these things. You, you, always, you always feel like the letters U and N are missing in between the uh, the, the C and the T for some <laughs> reason. Right? So um, when oh. uh, you, you got cast in Fast and Furious 6, which, you know, as films go, compared to mm. the other feature films you've done at that point, must have, it, it must have felt a bit, mental you know the amount i mean the size of the crew complexities of the stunts all yeah that. i mean my i wasn't involved in any of that stuff but well, no no but uh, i mean we we shot in uh what was an old airfield down just by the or just off the m25 m3 another <coughs> another one you mean they shot some star wars it's the same place yeah yeah. They just took over that whole place and turned the 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 the, the, air, the, 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 the runway and track into a into a racetrack and things like that. Mm. And shot and built sets there and built cities and stuff. Always amazing these big Hollywood films when they you go there to the studio and they've built you know a, an entirely new London because they can't actually film in London. It's not practical. So, but they want that. So they build London and and drive their cars and stuff. And, and, and it's just exact replica of, I, I always find that amazing. Um, I remember mm. once going to Palmwood and they built, there was Gotham, Gotham City. Was built. Yeah, I've seen that. I, I was there the other week and they've still got the pictures of that set in the hallway, you know. Yeah. Um, and it was all the sets were all built actually around the other studios so that they created like a big long road. Yeah, um, yeah, well, I, I might, it's stunning. Uh, the, the skill of doing that is just, I like yeah. that. The engineering feat is amazing, yeah. as, well, as well as the creative feat of it as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. so that, yeah, I, as I said, didn't uh, personally wasn't involved. My scene was a tiny little scene in an office. Um, but, um, I'm working with Dwayne, Dwayne the Rock Johnson, who, yeah, how been, was that? He must have been deep in character because he wasn't the friendly chap he comes over like. He wasn't unfriendly, but no. he was very talkative. Okay. I, I think he was doing the method thing with his character. And there's a, I didn't know. There's a thing he does in those films uh, where he oils his arms up or something. He puts oil on himself. Right. And he was doing that before each take, and I thought, it's a bit fucking weird, isn't it? What, what are you well, doing I mean, a, a lot of men do it on Fire Island during the holidays, so I, I suppose it's a big thing in certain parts of the yeah, I, I just I just thought you're a tosser, and then I realised it was a character thing. Yeah, yeah. It's such a I fine line between it's such a fine line between character thing and tosser. Sometimes it's uh, <laughs> got to be got to be careful on that one. As yeah, it, it, it's very true. Yes. Yeah. I mean, um, fine line. Yeah. I, I, I'll, my my thing about Dwayne Johnson is, of course, we had that awful tragic incident on that indie western film where. The, oh, DOP, yes. the DOP got shot and killed. Yeah. And yeah. Um, by accident with what was called a cold gun on set. And and then the next thing you know, Dwayne Johnson says, Oh, there's not, I'm never going to have any real live guns on any of my films from now on. Um, I'm only going to have rubber guns. So I'm not going to work on a film unless there's rubber guns on set. And I'm like, hang on a minute, mate. So you're going to put all the qualified armorers who do a good job working in Hollywood, you're going to put them all out of work, are you? Because uh, mm. <laughs> you're not really thinking that that through, that that statement. These people work just as hard as you do for a living. 
as an actor. And, and the ones who are, I mean, you know, I don't know who's, responsibility that ultimately came down to i believe it was the second ad that that called it a cold gun when it wasn't but you know the armorer's job is ultimately the responsible but just because okay so if a stunt goes wrong on a on a set and a stunt man is killed which has happened invariably a number of times you don't say from that point onwards we're never going to have any stunts on a movie again yeah you know ever those kinds of big brash statements from somebody at that level i think are Personally, I think they're really foolhardy. You're, 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 what you're doing is you're putting people out of work. Tom Hanks made that big statement about how he couldn't play the role of the HIV man in Philadelphia today. That role should be played by a gay man. No, it should just be played by an actor who is good, whether they're gay, straight, or whatever. Ewan McGregor just played Halston Halston, the fashion designer from New York in a four-part yeah. miniseries. That was, I think, earlier this year or last year that came out. He is fucking phenomenal in that part. And I know a lot of gay actors went up for that role. And I know there are some people that thought it should have been played by a gay actor. But I personally thing, don't care as long as the actor's good. You know? personally think that, that, but I, I don't think, I personally think that, and I think the creators of those roles, the guy, the, the, the Philadelphia story, and um, mm. they create a character who is the story of that character, not that character's sexuality. Yeah. And yeah. therefore, the performance should be by anybody who can portray that, portray that character. I, I agree. The truth of that character. Yeah. I've done, I worked, I, I, I've done, uh, there are times when thing people, the actor should, a uh, character should be portrayed by a person who is that, of that whatever I don't yeah. Yeah, I, I'll explain further um like Eddie Redmayne was it Eddie, Eddie Redmayne played uh Stephen Hawking yeah yeah I had to be an able-bodied actor to, to, to do that because the story of that was started when he was able-bodied and the slow deterioration of his disease yeah absolutely and you couldn't do that with somebody who had that disease at the start of the film filming process no, uh, no. it had to be somebody who was able-bodied and then was able to portray somebody with that illness. Yeah. Same, but the opposite of that is I've I did a film called Sanctuary, uh, directed by one of my good friends from drama school called Len Collin, um, and it's all it's all about people with uh, uh, intellectual disabilities, um, and the entire cast all have intellectual disabilities, um, and I used to think, well, anybody can do that. I mean, I played Lenny from Of Mice and Men, who's got an intellectual mm. disability. Mm. And um, and I think, I, you know, I, I just say, no, an actor can play that role. I don't think you can now. I don't think, like, like, to play somebody with Down syndrome, you need somebody with Down syndrome. And they are just as good as fucking actors as anybody. There, there are, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, and there have been some yeah. cracking performances um, uh, if you in that see regard. Sanctuary, it's amazing. It's a love story yeah. between a, a, a Down syndrome guy and a, a girl who has multiple epilepsy problems. Sure. Uh, uh, and, and tremors all the time. So there's both the actors. It's based on those actors' lives, not that yeah. they're others, but their 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 physical uh, their disability is is based on them. Uh, and then there's all the people around them that, at the centre where they go to. Um, and it's just about them trying to find a place to go and have a fuck, basically. Mm. <laughs> the story is the story of them to go to a hotel room and just have a nice romantic time. But at that time, when the film was written and made in Ireland, it was illegal. For it, there was a law brought in, I think maybe I don't know when it was, but there was a law brought in to protect disabled people from predators. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it was worded in such a bad way that it actually meant that disabled people couldn't have sex with themselves, with each other. That's right. Yeah, I remember. Uh, and fortunately, the, and the film was about that. But partially, partially about that, um, that they were being helped illegally to have a romantic night together. Well, yeah. And it changed the rule. It changed the law. The law was then rewritten after that film came out in 2016, 15, something like that. Mm. Um, and uh, I love doing films like that. I love doing things like that. I had a tiny part in it. But I just said to Len, I want to be in this film because I like, I like to be in. A film that makes an it makes 
makes something, makes a change in some way or another. Um, and if it's a big change like that, then fantastic. Yeah, I mean, most of my work has been about some either social commentary or something in the social political milieu. Yeah. yeah. Um, you but, know, um, that, that's my yeah. way of contributing to society because I'm not a massive believer in um, voting affects change. I mean, it does, but it doesn't, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So um, I try and try and permeate people's consciousness with with the work that I do. That's 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 my yeah. way. Um, I do think can... I do think that the, the, the yeah with the physical thing, uh, you should cast people who are who who are that unless for some reason there's a there's a actual practical reason that that, that can't be done. Mm. But in terms of somebody's sexuality. Yeah. Then, no, anybody because, can try that. Because if you're saying that... Then only, in the 40s yeah. and 50s, gay men were playing straight men for, constantly. This is this is my point, because, I mean, look, I, I only read an interview with this quote. I haven't seen Tom Hanks. And, I, I, you know, he may have been misquoted or, or it may have been taken out of context. But in the context I read it in, it sounded like Tom Hanks said you know, that part ha would have to have been played by a gay man today. But if you're arguing that, what you're also saying is, well, then straight roles can only be played by straight people, which is yeah. utter nonsense. And um, uh, uh, and gay actors don't want to be pegged just to play yeah. gay roles. And, um, and, and actually, people's sexuality unless you're doing a, a piece that is specifically about that really about that um mm. and, and you want people who've got those experiences and you you want them to bring those experiences to their characters and to the screen and a good example of that is it's a sin most of the young actors that were in that are, are gay you know um and and I guess that sort of production is all the better for it in in terms of realism realism and everything but 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 that particular film and that particular role that wasn't at the core of his sexuality was at the core of the reason why he was being po prosecuted and uh, by his own company and the the illness but it but his journey of his sexuality was not the narrative nub of that movie so i i yeah and and again i cite the example of ewan mcgregor in that recent part he was just phenomenal he smashed that part i completely believed him and at the end of the job, at the end of the day, that's the actor's job to completely sell the performance to me, the viewer. So I, I believe I'm seeing this guy's life. That's that's what I want from my actors. And um, yeah, so it's a controversial topic, but it's uh, it's one that's doing the rounds um, at the at the moment. So I want to. You mentioned Bill Paxton earlier, who's one of my favourite actors of all time. Um, he was a uh, also a really good friend of another good friend of mine um who's an actor you may have worked with you certainly would know who he is um donald logue um, oh, donald, yeah, i don't i haven't worked with him I, I don't know him but i know of him if you get a chance to work with him do he's one of those actors who's you know you know if you're in the room with an actor who's a, a giving actor yeah um, he's does, a great actor actually i mean i remember watching the blade second one i think it was where he, which he's in He's in the first one. He's the he's the first DJ. One. He's right. he's the DJ, he's the vampire DJ in the first film. Yeah, kind of like um, Stephen, um, St the the guy who plays the main villain. Stephen, Stephen what's Dorf. his name? Yeah, Stephen Dorff. Uh, he's his like his his he's one of his main henchmen. Yeah, psychic, psychic, yeah. Yeah. He, I mean, I watched that film a few, a few times, and I never ever at any point clicked that he was. Uh, a not American, and B not some s large psychotic person. But actually, Don Donald Logue is the opposite of both of those, isn't he? Yeah, he's, 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 he is not American. He's Irish, uh, and he's he's just he's not a big he's not a big fella. But he, he portrays this kind of big psycho vampire. And I thought that was great. He was fantastic and brilliant uh, in in all the other stuff he's done, like. Yeah, he's um he's a really good guy, and he was supposed to play the role that Jason ended up playing in the journey. Oh. And, um, and Jason was supposed to play the lead part, and um 
uh, and I, I lost them both together in the same week. And I was Nikki, um, Amuka, Nikki Amuka Bird was supposed to be in it as well, and I lost her at the same time. And so I had this really, I mean, listen, the actors I ended up with were all great, and I'm very grateful to them. But I had this massive like card card shuffle of the cast, uh, you know, with weeks to go before filming. It was, right. but that was a shame that Donald and I didn't get to to work on that because I wrote that role of the kind of nomad who is actually the uh, Greek. Greek god Dionysius, if you got that twist at the end, that they're all Greek gods, the the characters. Right. And um, yeah, he's the party guy. And, you know, Donna was perfect for that sort of character. But when Jason said, well, I can come on it, but you've only got me for two days. I just lost Donna. And I thought, right, well, we can shoot most of your scenes in two days. And then we, we did two right. days within one year and two days the following year. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Donald's, Donald's great. So Bill Paxton directed Bill. you, right? He did, yeah. Yeah, I was um, the greatest game ever played uh, was the film uh, about the 1913 U.S. Golf Open. Um, yeah, I I, his, his I, I don't know if you remember, but as soon as I watched it, I messaged you to tell you I'd seen it. Do you remember? Yes. I messaged you on Facebook. I was like, oh, I just saw you in this movie and I really liked the movie and you were really great. And um, <laughs> and it kind of came out of the blue because I never would have expected to see you in a golfing, a film about oh, American yeah. golfing history. That was that came out about because of Lockstock. Right. I literally got, a, I got an email from my agent here in LA, who is not anymore, but was then. Um, and he said, can you play golf? And I do, did a little. And I said, yeah, I play a little golf. So, okay, next thing I get a, 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 an email about two hours later saying, um, the director wants to talk to you about a film. Here's the script. Have a read. So I read it. Like, yeah, yeah, it's great. It's lovely. Uh, and um, then we arranged his call, and I literally, it was like something out of Hollywood. I'm talking to Bill Paxton on his car on his car phone, drive, and he's driving down a PCH, going back to his own home in Ohio. It's like something straight out of the 1980s. Uh, story and yeah. it's going hi, it goes hi Stephen. I said, I said, um, uh, did you read the script? Yeah, so do you like it? Yeah, you want to do it? Yeah, okay, <laughs> speak to you later. And that was it. And he got, I got the job offer straight like that. Nice, I found out later it's because he'd seen me in Lockstock. That's, I mean, um, I never got to meet Bill, which is a, a real shame, and, and his loss was was really felt when he passed away way before mm. his time and um and he was much much beloved in the, in the industry you could just yeah. tell um so i'm guessing the experience of working on that set and being directed by him must have been a a, a really joyful one it was, it was such a per uh, i mean he, uh, he had so much energy um, right. all the time every day you'd come in uh and the first thing in the morning and you, you've been up all night from misbehaving or whatever and, ah. and, and Bill's there. Right. What are we doing? We're we doing this. We're doing this. And he'd be out there. And the whole the great thing about it is because he's an actor, he understands what uh, the performance on screen means to a film. Yeah. <coughs> and he, he would get that A out of the actors, but he also got it out of the crowd for this film. Half the half the film was about the crowd. About yes, yeah, with, with on the golf course where they're following yeah. the mountain. Yeah. Yeah. And he got these, he would come in every day and he'd stand there in the middle of the, the we're doing a scene on the green or whatever, and he'd be there and there'd be all these extras around and he'd be in amongst the extras, getting them, lifting them up with his own energy, just lifting them up so that they were up at the same level as everybody else. Uh, he, he, he was an amazingly fun, nice guy and a very talented director as well as performer. They must have all been shouting quotes um, from aliens at him every five minutes. You know, yeah, man, it's a dry and all that. Cut, cut. You want some of this? You want some of that? And you've yeah. got, you also worked with two of two others of my favourite actors on that on that movie, Elias Cotius, who I think is massively oh. underrated. Yeah, um, yeah. And Stephen Delaney, um, whose career just seems to be really uh, going stratospheric in the last like five ten years. Yeah. Um, how how was working with both of them? Because you had scenes with both of them, I think, if I remember rightly. I uh, did I have scenes with Elias? Because yeah, Elias, oh, I did. I didn't do any know. scenes with Elias, no. But I did. Yeah, Stephen, we were in every scene together. Right. Um, 
yeah, Stephen Stephen uh, was was great. He's a very quiet man, actually. Very like his I've, characters. I've heard characters. that. Yeah. Yeah, he comes across as um, very. He's very controlled. I think his characters are very controlled, and and that's because he is. I think, he's, and I don't mean that in a negative, bad way. No, no, I've heard he's very it's professional, just, and you know, it's just it's just nice things. Centered, centered, maybe is the word I'm thinking of. Rather yeah. controlled. He's very centered, and and his characters are centered, and that's perfect for a golf movie. Actually, for playing the Godfather of golf, Harry Barden, the man who created the modern grip of the golf club. Uh, yeah. the locking finger grip, uh, uh, and is, is considered the godfather of golf. Um, and golf is a very much a cerebral sort of it's a physical sport, but it's also cerebral, it's very mental. And mm. uh, Stephen comes across, he, he, he brings that mentality somebody who's deep in their own self, uh, as a character, I mean, not as a person. Um, yeah, I like him, I like to be working with Stephen as well. Uh I mean, I've got to ask you this question because there are so many stories. Shia LaBeouf, was he, you know, fun to work with or was he bat as batshit crazy as everyone makes out? He's not as batshit crazy as he is now, no. Yeah, he was well, 18 then. He was 18 when we did that film. So, yeah, it was a, not long after, around the first Transformers movie, I think, was probably not. Uh, I'm not sure which one came. I think it, Transformers came... Maybe a bit later. Before or after, I'm not sure. But I think it might... I don't know. But he, yeah, he was a, he was an eighteen year old, uh, an eighteen year old that was tortured, and uh, he um, he was very argumentative. He was literally one of the. He was like a teenager, you know. Yeah. Says, okay. You say black, he says white. Um, you say the sky is blue, he says no, it's not. Yeah, it is. No, it's not. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. That, that, not that kind of thing. Well, he gives a great performance. He's a very good actor. I do think he's a very, he's a very, very good actor. Um, he has some extreme thoughts of life, but he's a very good actor. And um, what would you look at looking back on that production, which, like you say, it's really nice to be asked by someone of Bill Paxton's caliber and literally be offered a, a job on a, a phone like that of, of yeah. working on that that production what's what's your fondest memory of that film um my darling wife <laughs> well, she True. came, she uh, came with you on the shoot we cemented our relationship and 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 i i it was kind of i knew that she was going to be my wife did you um, propose, did you propose to her in the sand pit of the golf course or something <laughs> no i didn't like the ring ring was on the golfing tee or no 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 we went through a few um, I won't go into it, but we went through a few few torturous moments before we got to the part. Uh, okay. uh, uh, but but I kind of knew, yeah, I knew it, she was she was um, going to be mine, <laughs> or what was it? I was going to be hers. Um, Maintaining in terms of uh, in, in terms of uh, so that that was my personal great memory. Okay, it was a fantastic film to work on. I've had such still friends with so many people on it. Uh, on production side and on, um, uh, on the actors as well. Mm. Um, uh, like uh, there's a, the, the producer, the line producer on it, David uh, um, David Blocker, who is the son of Dan Blocker, who was Hoss in um, that cowboy western show with Lawn Green. Um, oh, uh, Bonanza. Bonanza, yes. He was big Hoss in Bonanza. David's dad. He's got a okay. beach named after him on 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 on, uh, on uh, down in Malibu. And why not? And Blocker Beach. Um, but yeah, David Blocker is still stay in touch with. He he he's a great producer now uh, as well. Um, did uh, Into the Wild and things like uh, films like that. Doing TV yeah. series now. <clears throat> uh, stay, yeah. So I made we did make I made good friends out of that film. Um. Well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna speed through my last questions because we've actually gone over the time that I, I talk too much. No, 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 this is great, man, and I, I mean I'm sure I could happily stay on with you from another hour, but we can always get you to come back. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of of your whole career, mm -hmm. um, it might be Bill Paxton that's the answer to this, but if you could go back and work with one person again, actor, writer, director, who was the most fun to work with? Who would you work with again? 
well, who'd be at the right, front of the you're queue. You're all right, Bill Paxton. Yeah. yeah I'd definitely oh. love to uh, work with, again with him. In the next um, life, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, had, I tell you what, I had great fun with a, a friend of mine, uh, an actor called Jonathan Moore, who we worked together on My Beautiful Laundrette. Um, and he's a director as, now as well. Uh, right. You remind me of him a little bit. You've got some of look. Uh, he's a South yeah. London boy. Everybody says I look like Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> you do with that as well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but Johnny, Johnny and I used to have such a laugh on the set of uh, My Beautiful Laundrette, messing around, got me into trouble a few times with Stephen Frears, um, just from messing about. And then we did a Rivadechi Millwall together, the play. Um, and then he got me, the, one of the great theatre jobs I, I got to do was we were working, we were doing a, a, a little profit share show at the King's Head together while he was setting up to do uh, another job. He was an opera director. And mm. um, I come in one day and he goes, he goes, Steve, can you just read this script for me? This little bit of page of script so I can just hear it out loud. So I read it. There was a messenger coming in. He said, Thanks very much. Next day I come in. He's on the phone and he's going, well, yeah, right, all right, well, fuck you. Fuck you, you're fucking fired. Bang. Looks at me and goes, Steve, what are you doing next uh, in March? I'm not doing anything. So, you know that bit of script you read yesterday? Do you want to do it? Yeah, all right. <laughs> I turn up on this job. We go to Barbados to be part of the Holders, Holders Theatre Festival, Classical Theatre Festival. We're doing an opera in a plantation garden for with uh, Jody Kidd's parents who ru I, I run it, um, and I am playing not the messenger. I'm playing the other character in it, who's the second lead in this opera. Uh, I had to sing four songs with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra in front of Pavarotti on one night. Bloody hell! No pressure, but you were in Barbados, so you know. I was in Barbados. I had a wonderful. I, that that was that was fun, and I nearly killed myself there while there as well. First night party, we're all having a party and we're all having a good time, you know, boogie boogie, kick, 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 all that sort of business behavior. I all decided, right. I've run out of cigarettes, so I jump in a car, a mini moak, you know, one of them holiday mini moke things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, drive down the hill to the garage at the bottom of the hill, grab some smokes, and driving back up, bus comes around the corner, I don't stop in time, bang, head on crash with, the, with this bus in this mini moke. Oh. Split the head open, got taken to hospital, spent five days laid up in bed. <laughs> yeah. I, I had the uh, most bizarre morning after. Me and the other guy that was in the car with me, uh, we like we got taken back to the, the the kid family residence to be looked after by them because otherwise right. the hospital wouldn't let us out. Right. So we go back and we wake up in the morning to. Um, uh, Gemma, kid, Jody's sister, Jody, and this girl, called, friend of theirs, Rachel, uh, coming in with a tray of breakfast stuff to us in tiny little crop tops and panties, and that was it. And me and him thought, literally looked at each other, thought, have we died and gone to heaven? Yeah, and we'll be picking that up on the next interview to find out what happened. Um, this might be a good segue into my next question, which is, <laughs> What was your most embarrassing moment on set or stage? Now that's one of them that was off set. Um, on set, uh, most embarrassing. Yeah. Or comical, you know. Oh God, I mean, I'm, um, I'm now, I know there are many to choose from, but you know, just a uh, big one. There are a few, yes. Um, well, one you can talk about at least. I think one that makes me cringe, and I wish it, it never happened was I was doing a film, TV movie, uh, called The Black Velvet Band in South Africa uh, for Yorkshire Television with mm. uh, Nick Berry. Oh, yes. And God, we're Nick rehearsing Berry. a scene, uh, and uh, there's a scene in the scene where I lose my temper completely and storm out. And we're doing the rehearsal. And I, my brain switched off and I got so, I got, I just, this rage hit me. 
and I picked up a table and just kind of threw it up in the air. Nobody got hurt, nothing got damaged, but it nearly took out the entire dolly and camera uh, when it happened. Um, right. And I should have been fired, really, but I wasn't. Well, you've got to be grateful for these things. Yeah. And um, it's, yeah, it's one of those, I literally feel sick at the thought of looking back on it now. Uh, we've all, you know, I mean, I remember um, way back, we were doing a show, uh, the Victoria Climbia Inquiry, which was a really difficult, heavy drama. I think it was the Hackney Empire. Uh, I don't remember much about it, but one thing I do remember is one of the actresses I was directing sort of looked to me just, you know, the opening night. So, Lance, any last minute advice? And I just said the first thing that came into my head, which was don't fuck up. It's not really, you know, <laughs> wasn't, I, you know, I mean, it's a, it's I, a, I was, I was young. Like Sorry, I, it's a bit like that actor, that director that said, let's try acting, yeah. dear girl, dear boy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was to dust. That was, um, Oh, Larry, Larry Olivier does yeah, yeah. he, he was over processing his 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 role. Um, no, I mean I just I just should have you know been a bit more fatherly and said you're going to be fantastic. Just stay in the moment, right? Remember to breathe and and knock it out of the park. You're you're going to be great. You know, she just said that, and she was a cracking cracking actress as well. Um, and was she great? And did she knock it out of the park? No, she was good. She was good, and they all had really difficult. They were all playing real people, and we had to play them as close to the bone as we could. Um, right. And um, you know, you know, and that was that was that was part of the mission. It was you, you uh -huh. want people to think we're at the inquiry, really, and, no. and we had social workers and all sorts coming to see it. So um, uh, when it comes to stuff, I mean, I don't know if you go to the cinema much, and you're out in America now, so mm -hmm. maybe in this question we can include kind of you've you've up sticks and and gone out there uh the whole kit and caboodle is that a were you getting lots of castings in the in the states i mean what 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 sort of led to that decision um, um I, I, basically the, the the decision came about because it's time to do it was time to give it a go really. time to come here and i just got my green card I, I, we, 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 we we talked me and my wife had come here a few times and lived here for a little bit and we lived here for 18 months prior to that, prior to coming out here in 2017. And um, always kind of wanted to come back. And uh, and the, the, it was kind of like, it was the timing was right, really. It was just a timing thing. Uh, I've come out here. I haven't actually, on, to be honest, I haven't been able to get much work since I've been here. Right. Uh, it's very difficult. There's a marketplace is much more swamped. Mm. Uh, and my age group, there's a lot of people around here who've been here for years. Mm. I've come, I'm coming here and starting again, almost. Yep. So I'm up against people who've been here for 30 years. They're known. They're, they're, they're like, well, who do we have? The new boy who we don't, we know, but we don't know. Or we have Frank Boff. Frank Boff. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, football commentator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we, have, we have Frank, who, um, who we've known and loved for 30 years. Yeah. So, you know, one, it's it's been it's been a hard challenge, but I'm getting I get great auditions. I've got a really good uh, representation team uh, who who get me some very good auditions uh, and very good for very good films, very good jobs. Um, yeah. Example being recently didn't get that. I got the great audition. Didn't quite get to the job though. Was four movies for TV being directed by Kevin Costner and a main role in those. So right. I, I, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting there. Did you put your oh, cowboy right. hat? Did you put your cowboy hat on for those? No, guys? they said no hats. They said no, no, okay. no hats. They actually do say that sometimes right. because people. There's a thing here, and it does happen a bit in England, where people dress up, particularly for commercials. People dress like the character, mm. particularly like if you're playing a cop or something. You, mm. you, you go to the audition room, and there's 20 cops there, dressed mm. all the gear, even with the guns and everything. Right. Uh, they're coming in fully. Fully loaded for bear, uh, and so so they sometimes say, "No, we don't want you to do that." You know, right? People do. Um, so no hats. Um, it's a hard. It's, yeah, it's been a hard struggle, and 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 I think anybody who's uh, coming here really shouldn't just do it on a whim or on on the back of nothing. They no. Yeah, I mean, we we behind them. 
we we did an episode of this. I think I mentioned it to you, and you can go and you can, you know when you're really bored, you can watch it on your downtime. But it's on the channel. It's called Brits in LA, uh -huh. and, I, and I interviewed two British actors, one of whom I've directed a couple of times, Raymond Kim Subtle, who's probably well, he's a bit younger than you, but he's around your your age. Fortunately, right. fortunately um, he's a completely different physique and campus Christmas. So you and him will not be going up for the same roles. Mm -hmm. but, um, he's a guy who always likes to do little projects in his downtime, whether that's a short or he might put on some kind of showcase. He's very proactive. So yeah. if you ever feel you, 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 you just want to do some more things to stay proactive out there, let me know and I'll, I'll connect you with him because that might be, might be quite useful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and there was a, another girl, and they, they said the same thing. You, you know, you've got to have a plan. It's going to cost this much money. You've got to have this. You've got to have this. I mean, your body of work must have been at least helpful in terms of getting you an agent and a manager. I think that's what it is. It's getting me in the door. I yeah. Mean, an example of what I just said about being up against people like, uh, who are more known. Or like, fr like, Frank, like Frank Boff, as we mentioned earlier. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I auditioned for a series called Preacher. Which I yeah, with recently. Dominic. Um, Dominic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And and uh, Ruth Nigger. Yeah, and I've got I've got the whole graphic novel series in the other room. Yeah, I love the graphic novel. I was, uh, well, I was quite. Fan of the TV show, but I, love I was it. I was about to say I was quite disappointed in the TV show, and as much as I love both of those actors, I felt they were miscast. Right. That they, yeah. they they weren't quite. I thought, but, but Ruth's performance, I thought, was really strong. Actually, she was amazing. I just, I think they I'm should sorry. have cast an American in in the in the lead. Yeah, uh, personally, I just because when you know someone's British and it's such an iconic role. Yeah, that's working against you. I've got the same problem with Carl Urban in The Boys. I can't stand it. Well, the role of the role of butcher should have been played by somebody like you or Craig Fairbrass. You or Craig, Fair, you or Craig could have nailed that part. And I mean, I've got to be honest, Craig looks a bit like him if you've read the if you've read the. Yeah, I think Craig would probably have been a better he, choice. Yeah, he would have been. And it, yeah. Carl's kind of cock, cock, cockney Oliver Twist. It, it just, it just great. And I love Carl Urban. You know, I'd work with him in a heartbeat. He's the best Judge Dredd ever. He should be uh, Judge Dredd in the TV show. He was fucking phenomenal in Lord of the Rings. Um, he's just, a, he's a great, solid actor. And I'm sure, you know, on paper, he thought this will be great for me and I really want to do this. But he, that accent would be fine in theatre, but in television where it's such, under such scrutiny and you've got Cockneys like you and me watching it, it's just painful. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like apples and pears, apples and pears. You know, it's it just... It's a bit, yeah. It's yeah. yeah, but yeah, but you were you went up for preacher. That's that shows yeah, yeah, was, now, the role though. of the All Father. The role of the yeah, All Father. That's I mean, a good that, that's a good part, but they didn't do it very well in the show. But it's great no, in the comic. We got down to me and the guy who did it, uh, an actor called Johnny Coyne. Right. Uh, and the casting people told me uh, they said we absolutely loved you. We thought you were spot on, perfect. Unfortunately, the producer had worked with Johnny before. Right, so and yeah. and and that's what you face often when you're new in the place. You face a lot of that where the producers know a certain, a, 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 another actor. But uh, at least at least you are getting seen by key people, and it's great to get yeah. that feedback. You know, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So ho hopefully uh, they'll put you up for something else. Exactly. Yeah, and and it has worked that way. I've I've come in for I've been for castings with uh, with uh, there's a, a casting director here called April Webster who is probably the top casting director in, in Los Angeles, uh, if not the world. Um, uh, she is... Um, Hello, Tabasco Scenario. Thanks for tuning in, buddy. Continue. She, she, she does all the Star Wars movies, the Star Treks, the Star this, Star that, everything. Um, if you look up April Webster's IMDb page, it's endless. Yeah. Um, uh, and I did, I met her well, uh, probably 15, 20 years ago when I first came to LA, first time, first time I ever mm. came to LA. Mm. Uh, did an audition for her, and she said, she said to me at the time, she said, "What do you? What's going on with your voice? When you start speaking with an American accent, it totally changes." And I was kind of going from "Hi, I'm Stephen Marcus" to "Hi, I'm Stephen Marcus." Uh, and um, she's like. 
and I never saw her again for 20 years. And then right. she brought me in for this Kevin Costner thing I just mentioned before. Right. And she's brought me in twice for another two other things since. So I've always, my, my accent's improved. Yeah, I mean, nailing accents is really hard. Uh, certain oh, I, accents that are really, and you've got to just keep doing it like riding a bike. You've got to just keep, keep yeah. you know, it's like a and gym. And also thing. here, if you're not American, you get put up for all the non American rocks. So you yeah. get, if, I would advise anybody to get their accents sorted out for a various rock. I've just done Scottish, just done uh, uh, Irish, anything that's European, I go up for. Yeah. Much. As long as it's not kind of an eth ethnic. So, um, in in the last sort of two three years, you know, during the lockdown where we all got to watch Tiger King and and that kind of thing, <laughs> um, what stuff did you see on television? Probably not the cinema so much because they were all closed. Yeah, no. but, but what stuff did you see? Shut TV TV dramas in particular. I'm thinking of I, I that you thought shit. That's good. I really like that. That was great. I, I have a tendency to um, to look back at old stuff. To be honest. Okay. Uh, well, can you give me some of them as well? Rewatch. Re right, right before this uh, this this podcast, I was uh, I'm I'm, I'm rewatch. I'm not rewatching. I'm I'm watching it for the first time. Actually, is Oz. Oh my god, that's so good. Yeah. I just um, rewatched. I've got the. Uh, I don't know if it's behind me. Uh, it's in the other room, I think. I've got the DVD box set of that uh, of season one. Yeah, uh, well, and I, um, I watched season one. I'm just starting season two. Yeah, it, I mean, it's the quality of the acting in that show that really sells it. You've yeah. got, you know, the guy who plays Schillinger, who's gone on to great things, but that oh, was. Okay. He's. That, um, he, apparently he's um he's the big, his big thing at the moment is he's, he's super buff now. Yeah, I know. He's the oldest sort of. He's kind of almost a bodybuilder, where he's just kind of trained so so mad. He's, he's like uh, the guy that played Quidditch in uh, Avatar, um, who proper bulked out for for that part. Which one's um, the character is that? Quidditch. Quidditch. Uh, he was the bad guy. He was the guy who gets shot with the arrows in the end. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, they're the bringing him. He's bringing him back for the sequel, though. So he's going to be as he's coming back in an avatar body for the sequel. They've somehow cloned him or something. I don't know. Oh, so right. He's coming back. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, watching that. Oh. And also, um, my dear, uh, uh, the the guy I did when I did a Reba Dirty Mill, the play. Yeah. Uh, in '85, we had a, a young man called Eamon Walker in it then. Who is in Oz? He plays Karim, Karim, the the Muslim guy. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's because so, uh, that's a British actor, and yeah, he's brilliant. Yeah, he is brilliant. So yeah, what's that? Um, I've also recently what The Wire. I've rewatched that a few times, um, which is uh, brilliant. Similar, same actors actually in Oz and The Wire. A lot of the same actors. Have you seen? The Shield. No, I have not. Oh, my God. Well, I'm doing a top 10 crime uh, crime shows with Craig Fairbrass soon, uh, I hope. And uh, we've had to reschedule it a few times because he had to go off to South African film. This is my favourite cop show of all time. I think the writing and the performances uh, are phenomenal. And it's got the perfect arc with all the characters, all the characters' arcs. I just love it. I think it's... It's the best cop show ever made. It came out a month before The Wire. And um, I felt that The Wire, critically, I felt The Wire stole its glory a bit. And um, The Shield is like the noisy big brother. I'll tell okay. you another one. If you like your cop shows, you definitely also want to see the French equivalent of The Shield, which is called Braquo. Okay. That is an absolutely phenomenal show. And I'm betting you that both of these are going to be in mine and Craig's top ten. So they were certainly both going to be in mine. Um, uh, what about what about this is the other one I've been watching, and I've just finished the whole season seasons. Sorry, Italian show called Gamora. Ah, I have that also. I've got, yeah. They're all in the, in the DJ case in the, uh, just down here. But, right. um, yeah, so so good. I mean, the last season five has kind of got a bit weird. Yeah, I, 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 they, they start calling Chiro the immortal. Um, yeah, um, yeah, and they did they did the spin-off movie where the character comes back to life and that right. I, I, I sent I, I, uh, 
I sense that the show got cancelled and somehow got rebooted because of foreign sales because it's more popular overseas than it is in Italy, apparently. Right. Um, but the first three seasons, especially when the dad was still in it, are really, yeah. really good. I really like that actor who plays the dad. He's a proper powerhouse. Yeah. He's like an Italian version of you. He's a proper powerhouse <laughs> presence. Oh, um, um, and, of course, the great my I, I haven't watched it again for, for a while, but the fantastic Sopranos. Yeah. Um, which is one of the, the best TV shows ever made. There's another, let me just grab the, the thing. There's another Italian show, which um, I want to recommend you, and I can't remember the name. I think it's in, oh my God. See, look, I've deboxed all my DVDs, and they're all in these now. Uh, DJ cases. This one is massive. And um, this one mainly contains um, dramas. And uh, I think then there's a foreign section. Yeah, here we go. Um, which has got Gamora and all that in it. Um, there's another show. It's about the origins of... Um, about set, set, set in Sicily. And yeah. it's, the, it's the origins of the Mafia. Oh, right. um, and it, and it, it's the true story. And it goes right through to the 90s with the famous thing where they, they blew up the highway to take out that judge and... It's, oh, yeah. a, it's a phenomenal show, really well acted, and based on the other stuff that you've now I can't find it, of course, but based on the other I, stuff. I was, that you've I, was, told I was thinking me. about it um, when you said what uh, one of the questions I will ask will be this. Uh, and um, all my favourite TV shows and film and films do tend to be crime related. Uh, I have a big thing about crime, true crime, uh, and. Yeah, I don't seem to be able to get away from it. There's no, I don't have any love for romances. I like comedy, but I don't really like, some people just like, ah, oh, watch The Office constantly, always watching The Office. I love right. The Office. I think it's hysterical, but I could live without it. Um, no, it's just an example. There are other shows that people do that with. There you go. Look, this is part of the Italian crime section. So there's a whole load of Gamoras. This is Octopus, which preceded more as one of the main sort of early uh gang story which is another good one if you've not seen it you still uh, haven't found that one though yet the one you're thinking of in it romanzo criminale you seen that no. that's that's a good show uh again that was kind of sabura it's another good one that was then made into a tv show um no i still haven't found it you're right <laughs> <laughs> my might it might be one of the ones that i didn't de-box so, so yeah, the crime thing though. Going back, just sort of, I don't know why I like crime. I think there's something actors always get involved with um, nefarious people sometimes, and, and nefarious people get involved with actors. They like yeah, to rub yeah. off, they like to rub off on each other, don't they? Um, there's like certainly a bit of that going on around the rise of the foot soldier uh, franchise. I feel sometimes. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I mine. Because of Lockstock, people assume I'm a bit of a, a bit of a naughty geezer, which um, I'm not. Um, but there are people who have a difficulty differentiating between the character and reality. Yeah. Some, some uh, not many, but some do. Uh, have, you, have you ever had that thing where someone's tried to sort of have a pop at you on the street? You know, oh, you're that hard geezer from that thing. No. But, that, oh, that's, that's something to be thankful for. Yeah, but I, I, I do have, I haven't... I, I have a, 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 a past addiction in my life, uh, which I have been clean now for 17 years. Right. Uh, but when I was using uh, substances, uh, I used to get my stuff from a, a lady who had a boyfriend who generally thought I was uh, the characters that I played. Right. And was scared of me. Not scared, scared, but was apprehensive around me. He was a bit more nervous than he would be with other people. Right. Um, which was kind of to my advantage because he was a bit of a thug. Yeah. Uh, wasn't a nice person. And so the fact that he was kind of nervous around me kept him from being not nervous and not being a nice person around me. Yeah, got you. Yeah. 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 So that was good. That I was mean, good. also getting insight into that, those 
kinds of characters that populate that world, if you're going to be cast in those kinds of roles, it's useful for an actor, of course. Um, yeah. You've got to be like a sponge and soak it all up, haven't you? And, and Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So... Um, and it's a, it's a nice compliment as well as, as, a, as, a, as a performer to, sure. um, to be, to be uh, have people believe what you're portraying. No, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. That, 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 I think that's the biggest compliment. Yeah. I mean, not so much fun for Mark Savage, who played Gripper Stebson, who got quite a lot of abuse uh, for that when he was on Grange Hill, if you remember that character. But um, he was the racist who, right. when they did the whole season about racism, and um, just that was that was the year after Tucker Jenkins had left. It was with Stu Pop when Mark, uh, Paul, uh, you know, Mark and Ray Burdis. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Mark Burdis was in Grange Hill uh, playing yeah. Stu Pop. That it was that whole era. Right. Right. Um, and he was so good. Mark Savage was so good at playing this character. People would have a pop at him on the street all the time. Oh, you're a racist and all this, you know. So no, I'm just an actor playing a part. I yeah. think he was, he was at X Anna Shares as well. So, um, so what should um, I feel like I've kept you on far too far too long? So, no, let, let, but it, no, it's great. I mean, you know, let's get you on again what? to talk. Maybe you should come on with Craig when we do the top ten crime things. Um, but um, what you got coming up? What's what's what? What, what have you just filmed, or what's coming out, or? Um, there's nothing. I am. Um, I haven't got anything coming out at the moment. I'm. Uh, I've with lockdown and that lockdown here in LA has been quite severe. Yeah. Uh, uh, up until the beginning of this year, I haven't been out of the house for two years. God, yeah, of course you, because you you went out there 2017. So you know. Yeah. Two and a half years that's later. Been, that's been part of the reason the work has been thin on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for two years, I was pretty much. We were pretty much locked down, locked down here, yeah. um, and so, so, um, and also, my wife has underlying conditions, so we have to be extra careful, right? Uh, more than everybody else does. Um, but what was I going to? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, no, uh, nothing. Come but in that, I did fill out time in with. Uh, uh, I've written this great movie, uh, which we are trying to get made. We've. Uh, uh, it's called Kesara Sara. It's. <laughs> Um, story of a uh, uh, an aging uh, uh, aging bouncer in a strip club who is uh, looking wants to find love and right. uh, set his sights on this leading the leading stripper in the club. I'll tell you what that <clears throat> might, that Mike Powell would be great for that part. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Uh, uh, and uh, me, but also while trying to get this romance going, he's got he's looking after his dying father, uh, which was as I said earlier, being played by Walter Koenig. We've, right, we've got, okay, okay, yeah. We've got the whole film cast. We've got a director. We've got um, we've got a director. We've got everything. The only thing we're lacking at the moment is the money. Yeah, I've I've got about five projects like that. So what's yeah. the budget? What's the budget on that? Just in case. You know, I just, just in case I win the hundred ninety-four million pound rollover, which I'm going to be buying some tickets for tomorrow. It's a, um, yeah, two point five. Two point five. Okay. If oh, I win, if I win that money, I'll, I'll be one of the producers on it. I'm not going to give you right. a whole lot. But, um, uh, but yeah, it's. Um, I mean, we've, it's great. We just signed Judy, um, Judy, Julie, Julie Benz to play the lead girl in it. Uh, 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 Julie Benz was in. She's currently. Uh, she was in Dexter as the girlfriend of Dexter. She's currently in a show here called Nine One One. Oh yeah, no, that's that's a very popular show. Yeah, and she's uh, she was Ram in the remake of Rambo the reboot Rambo reboot. Yeah, uh, and so she's she's brilliant. Um, yeah, me playing the the main character Marty. Marty. That this is Julie Benz here. That I believe. is her. Yes, that is her. Um. And um, yeah, I've seen her in quite a few um, things. That's a nice bit of casting right there. Yeah, um, yeah Defiance. That's what I saw her in. Because um, I, yeah, I watched the whole thing of that, which sadly was cancelled. Um, right. So I mean, so where you're at is basically. You never showed my reel, by the way. I just realised we, we talked so long, we never went to the reel. 
Well, we haven't. No, I can't. I mean, I'm quite happy to show it, but I didn't want to keep you on just to show the reel, which is like, which I will also, the link for it's also already below us. But um, do you want me uh, to pop it on quickly? So, uh, shall I leave it, shall I? Yeah, leave it for uh, uh, another time. Um, it's funny because I, we, we're, the whole time we've been doing this interview, we've had no lag, but I can still see that things loading up are being slow tonight because I, I opened it. You, I've got another computer here, um, and I opened up your uh, showreel on that and um, still didn't come up. So All right. have you got meetings lined up for that? I mean, is there... Uh, I um, mean, yeah, what we've been doing, we're trying to get some... We're, we're in the process of generating some uh, um, I would, I want to say press, but it's not really press. Where we've entered, we've entered, and it entered the script into lots of writing screen screenwriting festivals. Okay. Right. Try and get some uh, attention to it that way. The first one we've entered it, entered it into, we've got uh, submitted and uh, into the semi final of the uh, of their awards system. So that kind of feels. Have, right you, right. have you heard it read out loud yet? Not yet. No, we we, we did plan a table already, but uh, we haven't got around to organising because. It well. The Outcast Creative did 60 table reads in the first year of lockdown. I think we did about 50 in the second year Wow! on, on Zoom. Yeah. And we're, and we're really good at telling it, doing them as well. So if you can get your five or six principles together, we would be quite happy to host it. And I'll get you some good actors to fill out the other little parts. And I'll also get you some cracking people to read the stage directions because that is the Achilles heel of doing a table read. Your person doing the stage directions has to be shit hot. Yeah. And, and yeah. also not boring, in my in my opinion. Yes. Uh, um, We've also uh, got to be not put too much character into it, but not be... No, but you, you don't want monotone. You, if it's yeah. an exciting scene and, and the stage directions are action, they should read it quickly, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that, so the, their, their tone and their pace should match what's on the page. Yeah, uh, not a character as such, but just match the the tone and the speed of the yeah, yeah. Of, of the script. But we'd be happy That's to good do to that. Know. That's very good to know. Actually. Yeah, let us know um, if and uh, you know I'd organise it um, probably after I get back from my little trip. But um, mm, yeah, yeah. Fa fantastic. So apart from your book, is there anything else we can plug for you um, before uh, we wrap up? Uh. No, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm very content with that. Thank you. Um, that's all right. And am I all right to put the link for the Vimeo show reel uh, in the blurb as well? Is that okay? Yeah. Just to give people a direct link to it. Um, uh, yeah. As opposed yeah. to the IMDb page. Well, look, Stephen, thanks so much for coming on. Um, I'm sure you've got dozens more stories. Um, so it'd be good to do a part two. Keep in touch with us about what's happening with the uh, with the I film think, itself. Yeah, you know if that it well, let's say when that happens and you've got it in the can, you know, come back and talk about it so we can get you know plug it even further for you because that's what this channel is all about is plugging creative people, yeah. whether they're at the top, middle, well, or bottom, especially indie creatives. We're all about that, you know. I'll tell you what you can do actually is put a link to the Kaiser Asraf. Facebook page. I absolutely will. Can you drop that for me in the uh, chat? Oh, <coughs> I don't do know. Right, I can do it right now. So, um, so having people li that? like the Facebook page would be uh, okay. okay. Let me um, let's have a look. Um, yep. Yeah, okay. I've got it. There it is. So. People can support or get interested. Yeah, just by liking come on there, give us a like, like. and um, and yeah, like the, like the page, like the film. And I, I we've just said I've just set it up, <clears throat> so hopefully uh, I'll be posting lovely, interesting facts every now and then. To keep attention. I am going to put the link um, right near the top of the description. Please uh, like and share. Page for Stephen's latest project. Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, 
and uh, uh, I'll put that in. So basically, when I've resaved this, it will be uh, down below. Uh, and if you could go on and like and even share the Facebook page, or even better, take 30 seconds to do a post about it, which is what I'm going to do when I get off this stream, um, uh, that would be really fantastic. And I'm sure Stephen would be very grateful for the support. Well, thanks very much. Those people watching, thanks for tuning in. I know I know more people will come and watch this in time when it's not so hot. Um, so, uh, and again, Stephen, um, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm going to be back with another industry interview on Wednesday um, where I'm going to be talking to people who build miniature models and in particular Jerry Anderson models to order. And we're oh. going to be uh, exactly as they were replicated in the studio originally. And you can see I've got my own big Thunderbird 3 uh, up there as well as a couple of toy ones. But the big pricey one is in the uh, uh, big thing. There's a, an eagle there. And actually there's, a, there's another eagle over there but yeah no i've just got so many toys in this room lego death star the lot um cool. so yeah uh, uh come in on wednesday at eight o'clock for that one and uh we shall see you all again real soon